seek, seek, seeking out opportunities and gearing up for challenges in the fourth industrial revolution. My name is Efrain Valenzuela of the Economic Policy Research Service and I will be your host for today. To start off, uh, let us welcome, welcome the Honorable Dante Roberto Mali, Secretary General of the House of Representatives for his welcome remarks. Thank you. Uh, esteemed guests, uh, House officials and staff, uh, sources speakers, good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome all of you today to this joint CPBRD, PIDS, and AIM Knowledge Sharing Forum entitled Seeking Out Opportunities and Gearing Up for the Challenges in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Let me extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone for making this possible. Indeed, this knowledge sharing forum is very timely as the world is once again transitioning towards a new development stage. Among the many things that I've learned to accept as inevitable in life is change. It will come however way we try to resist it. Change also connotes a negative impact for us human beings, of course. We do not want to get out of our comfort zones. This impact in our lives is even heightened when change is packaged as a revolution. It is, it is a challenge we need to face head on and eventually overcome as a natural recourse in our evolution as human beings. Hence for me, this forum is a timely and positive step for us in the government, the private sector, and the academe to work hand in hand as a preparation for the challenges presented by the fourth industrial revolution. We have witnessed how the first industrial revolution using steam power to, to mechanize production the second, which harnessed electric power to, to aid in mass production. And the third, which employed the use of electronics and information technology for automated production. They have transformed the way we live our lives. We have adapted to these changes presented by these wars, and we have used the fruits of these processes to make life more bearable and enjoyable for every one of us. The fourth industrial revolution, however, may be an entirely new being which we need to overcome, as they say, to take the bull by its head and overpower it. It is different for it is characterized by a fusion of technologies, sometimes practically blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological. And in more ways than one, it affects our lives in every other way. It is in this regard that I would like to thank Dr. Celia Imbayas and her PADS team, as well as Dr. Jik Yong Kang, sorry, and the AI, AIM and AIM group for partnering with Dr. Jun Miran and the CPBRD CPB department to help us understand the four, the four IR and prepare for its consequences. But the only way by which we can truly appreciate this revolution is to know it, understand it, and find ways to use it to our advantage so that in the end, we may be able to employ it and, and we may be able to employ it for the betterment of society in general and the world in particular. Again, let me welcome every one of you to this Knowledge Sharing Forum and I hope that we all have a fruitful and engaging afternoon. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General Maling. And now to give her message uh, on behalf of uh, PIDS President Dr. Celia Reyes, let us all welcome Dr. Sheila Shar, the Director for Research and Information of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies.
private sectors are gaining more interest in the fourth industrial revolution, or FIRE, as we call it at PIDS. Last September, we celebrated the Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, with FIRE as a central theme. For the whole month, we held a number of activities, including the annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC. The well-attended conference was a huge success as renowned local and international speakers and experts shared their studies and insights about the fire. As we also wanted to reach a diverse audience, we did media interviews on the topic in different parts of the country and also capitalized on new technologies, such as the social media. We are glad that even after the DPRM, we are still seeing other offices and organizations doing their own awareness raising activities and policy dialogues on the fourth industrial revolution. Industrial revolutions, as we know, have opened the world to vast opportunities. From the use of steam power in the 17th century, the emergence of ele electrical machines, trains, automobiles, and airplanes toward the end of the 19th century, to the early 20th century, to the introduction of digital electronics such as computers, mobile phones, and the internet. As what Honorable Dante Rob Roberto Malinga mentioned, now we are transitioning to the fire, which as experts describe, is the fusion of the physical, digital, and biological worlds, and is, and is expected to alter the ways we live and work. While it promises benefits such as increased economic productivity, <coughs> enhanced food security and healthcare services, as well as improvements in communication and transportation services, fire also poses risks and challenges that we need to overcome. Shop cuts, income inequality, regu regulatory and security concerns are just some of the things we need to address in order for us to harness the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. The knowledge sharing forum that we are having today will be, will be a big help in understanding the opportunities of fire among the sectors of business, government, academia, and civil society. More importantly, this forum will benefit policymakers who are present in this forum as they play a big role in helping the country prepare and address the challenges of fire. PIDS and the House of Representatives through the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department have a long tradition of partnership uh, that spans 19 years, if I am not mistaken. And we are fortunate to have with us today the Asian Institute of Management as a core partner in this forum. We hope that through this activity, we will be able to inspire all sectors to work together to address the challenges and take advantage of the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. Friends, let me end my message by showing you a video produced by PIDS which explains the opportunities and risks that come along with this new industrial revolution and also provide a summary of the policy recommendations, policy interventions that PIDS is putting forward to help our country and our fellow men harness the opportunities and gear up for the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you and have a good day. Globally. We've seen how nations strive to keep up with the digital world. <coughs> Hong Kong has recently launched its humanoid robot named Sophia. Hello, everyone. It's been a really exciting year for me. In the United States, cars are already driving on their own. In the Philippines, technological innovations are being developed by local scientists and are being adopted by Philippine industries. This is the fourth industrial revolution, an era of advanced technological breakthroughs. The fourth industrial revolution is reshaping the way people live, work, and communicate, from purchasing goods online, even with smart glasses, to boosting productivity of businesses, discovering new ways to provide better health care with 3D printed organs, to enhancing food security using robots and drones for precise range of herbicides. While the rise of this revolution provides new jobs and business opportunities, some jobs may be displaced. The International Labor Organization predicts that about half of jobs in five Southeast Asian countries 
are at high risk of being infected by automation. Jobs that are at risk are those that involve much repetition and less creativity. To prepare us for the risk of job losses and a likely rise in inequality, we must all understand the changing landscape and do our share in making our current and future workforce flexible for the emerging job market. We must also provide protection for those who may not be capable to adjust to changes. The government should be able to strengthen social protection, provide flexible social safety nets, and promote labor policies that will reduce worker exposure to risk. It should likewise introduce a robust program on emerging technology, such as putting more investment in research and development, increasing the school of scientists and engineers, and providing better incentives for innovation. Given the changing technological landscape, the government also needs to rethink its regulatory framework. It should make it more open, flexible, and less burdensome for new businesses and investments. Meanwhile, the business sector should assist its workers adapt to the demands of modern technology through retraining, on-the-job training, and mentoring and coaching programs. Both the government and the private sector should work together to create an environment that fosters and embraces innovation. The entire educational system also has an important role to play by mainstreaming digital skills in basic education, developing and promoting courses in science, technology, and mathematics, and incorporating both cognitive and non-cognitive skills development in their curriculum. The government, business sector, schools, and workers have a stake in harnessing the fourth industrial revolution. <coughs> Given that this revolution demands attention, we made it the central theme of this year's Development Policy Research Month. <coughs> Every September, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies leads the entire nation in celebrating the DPRM to emphasize the importance of policy research in the formulation of appropriate policy interventions to emerging and current development concerns. The fourth industrial revolution is here. Let us use it to our advantage. Thank you very much, Dr. Shar, and to the PADS for that very wonderful video. And uh, now to introduce our distinguished resource persons, uh, may I now invite Director Elsie Gutierrez of the Economic Policy Research Service. We have an exciting list of resource speakers for today's equally exciting and relevant topic uh, on the fourth industrial revolution. Our first speaker is Dr. Ji Kyung Kang. Dr. Kang is the president and dean of the Asian Institute of Management and holds the MVP chair in marketing. Prior to assuming her post at AIM, she was director of the DBA program at Manchester. Uh, business School from 2010 to 2014. At MBS, Dr. Kang has been instrumental in propelling the full-time MBA program's Financial Times ranking from 47th in the world in 2002 to 22nd in 2007, the highest ranking it has ever achieved. While she was in charge of the MBA programs, MBS became one of the first schools in the world to earn triple accreditation from the AACSB, Equis, and AMBA. Dr. Kang has also taught at top business schools around the world as a visiting professor in Madrid, Rotterdam, Paris, Montreal, Shanghai, and in Seoul. She currently serves on the International Board of AACSB, the world's largest business education alliance, and on the board of EFMD, an international 900 member organization of business schools and corporations. She's also an independent director of Security Bank and of Coseram in Industries, which is part of the BK Birla Group of Companies in India. Among the prestigious awards, awards she received are the Asia uh, HRD Award for Contribution to Organization and the Brand Laureate Best Brands International Brand Personality Award. 
Dr. Ji Kyung earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota, her master's degree from Colorado State University, and a bachelor's degree from Hanyang University, Seoul, Korea. Our second speaker is a senior fellow of PIDS, the government think tank. He, he was the chief statistician of the Philippines as the secretary general of the former National Statistical Coordination Board. Dr. Albert is a professional statist statistician who has authored papers and articles on topics spanning poverty analysis, education statistics, ICT statistics and big data, climate change, and innovation. He is also a member of various bodies and expert groups on statistical matters, including the United Nations Global Pulse Privacy Advisory Group and the Philippine Committee on Higher Education's Technical Committee on Statistics. He was also the president of the Philippine Statistical Association, Incorporated. For over 15 years, Dr. Albert has worked in various countries supported by develop, the development community, including the ADB. He has taught at several higher education institutions and has directed various statistical capacity building activities. He had a bachelor's, uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Mathematics, summa cum laude, and awardee of excellence in mathematics from the De La Salle University with a DOSTSEI scholarship. He earned his Master of Science in Statistics and PhD in Statistics from the State <coughs> University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, we're also expecting a uh, doctor. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Our third uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Faelita Adaba. She is the Assistant Secretary of the Industry Development and Trade <coughs> Policy Group of the Department of Trade and Industry. She plays a key role in the formulation and implementation of the new Philippine Industrial Policy and Inclusive Innovation <coughs> Industrial Strategy, or I3S, formerly the Comprehensive National Industrial Strategy, including the Industry Road Mapping Project, the Manufacturing Resurgence Program, and the rolling out of the Comprehensive Automotive Resurgence Strategy Program. She is in charge of the DPI's initiatives in establishing an ex inclusive innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem in the country in coordination with other government agencies, industry, and the academe. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Aldaba served as Senior Research Fellow and Acting Vice President of the PIDS. She has also conceptualized and managed research projects with various various international organizations, including the World Bank, ADB, JICA, and the USA. So please welcome our speakers. Thank you very much, Director Gutierrez. And now to give her presentation on the importance uh, of the collaboration between businesses, government, and uh, academe, let us all give a warm welcome again to Dr. Ji Kyung Kang, Dean and President of the Asian Institute of Management. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's uh, right after lunch, so hopefully I can have everybody awake. This is a topic that I feel really passionate about. Uh, so I have a lot of information here, and, and because I have to go back to AIM, uh, I have to leave about shortly after three, uh, we decide to take a Q&A after my speech. But if you want to interrupt me, please feel free to do so anyway. But before I start, I must say that I'm really impressed that we were able to start at 1.15, because normally we don't, right? <laughs> right, so uh, as you can see that uh, my background is, is really, really, uh, I always say on a good day, I'm a very cosmopolitan person. You know, I was born and finished the university in Korea. I went to America, studied there, and uh, worked at the University of Wisconsin Madison for nine years. Went to UK, but I did two years sabbatical in Spain. I talked all over the world. So coming back to Asia, I feel so passionate about what we need to do, especially in the Philippines. Before I start any of these. Uh, one of my passion comes from the fact that if you look at the higher education sector, 
especially in the business school world, you will see that all the top countries in Asia, Japan, Korea, China, India, even Korea, Singapore, they all have top universities, top educational systems, especially higher education. Now, UP, I have lots of respect. How many of you are UP graduates here? Okay, how many of you are Ateneo? How many of you are LaSalle? Well, I, I mean no offense whatsoever, but UP, where does it rank in the QS world ranking? 400 something. Okay, there was an article because you went up in a few spots. Um, Ateneo, 600 something. LaSalle, 700 something. In my view, I have no doubt we have to change this. Now, I cannot tell you if there is a cause and effect. Is it because we have a good university that these countries are doing well? Or because these countries are doing well, university ranking is going up. I, I cannot tell you the cause and effect, but what I do know is that we do need to strengthen higher education sector. Of course, K-12 as well, but, but that's where my passion comes in. Right, can I just take this off? It's okay, I don't have the big fix there. Right. As I said, I'm going to speak really fast. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, please say Jigyang, slow down. <laughs> right, so I'm going to just talk about VUCA world. As, as many of you know, this concept is new, but I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about Industry 4.0 from my perspective. I'm, I'm picking up the kind of information that I would like to address. And then I want to make a case why I so strongly believe in academia industries, corporations, and the business government need to work together. Especially when you are behind, collaboration partnership is going to be the key because none of us alone can do this, right? And then I'm gonna talk about uh, reimagining education, sort of bringing up and highlighting a few issues that I think that we need to pay attention and then I'll finish. So same in the context. Look, look at this, I mean, I became, I, I lived longer in America, but I never became a United States uh, citizen, but when I was living in the uh, UK for 15 years, I became a British citizen. It's after I came here, I wake up one day, and then I just couldn't believe BBC news on my phone, it says, Brexit. I just, I just, I never imagined that would actually happen. And when I realized that people were Googling what does Brexit mean after the vote was finished? <laughs> Meaning, most people just voted, just <laughs> listening to and looking at Facebook information, not really realizing what this is about. My heart just sank. I love this uh, Economist cover. In 2009, it says Brazil takes off. 2013, only four years later, it says, how has Brazil blown it? In four years, this is how the picture changed. Who can keep up with the oil prices? Who can keep up with the impact of oil on everything else that we see in the world? Um, so many people ask me all the time about what's happening between US and North Korea and how does South Korea fit in? I have no answer. I just hope they keep calm and cool. That's all I can <laughs> And try not to provoke each other, right? But I actually believe this guy is a smarter than <laughs> That's my personal view. <laughs> okay, Harry. So, you all know volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world is where we're living. The change is getting faster and faster, and it's not just unidimensional, it's very multidimensional, and it's unprecedented. I think that's, that's what scares us. You know, we always see the changes, but the rate of change has been so, so fast. This word, VUCA, was actually coined out of U.S. War College in 1998, but now it's only the last few years that we hear that word a lot because of what's happening in, in the world. So as I said, it's very fast, it's very unpredictable, we have a lot of disruption. So one of the things I talk to my students is that you have to keep in mind that you, whether it's the individual, you have to reinvent yourself, whether it's a, uh, a company, they have to disrupt their own successes, whether it's a product services. If you don't disrupt what you do, somebody else will disrupt you, okay? This is almost like a motto today. 
very multiple, very complex, and then there's no answer. Looking back, the history is always helpful, it's informative, but that's not gonna give us an answer. That's the basic assumption. Now, I show you this with a caveat that I don't seem to be able to find, actually verify, Einstein <coughs> ever said this, but that's besides the point, okay? He says, supposedly, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. I'm not so sure about that, but that's, that's just the, what you find in, in internet, right? If you believe everything that's there on the internet. So look at this. I, I apologize, it's a little bit sh small, so you may not be able to see everything. This is uh, showing, probably looks like coffee shop. There are one, two, three, five, maybe? <laughs> Friends sitting together, what are they doing? <laughs> they, they're just all focused on mobile phone, okay? This is a beach. What are they doing? They are all looking at mobile phone. This is a uh, stadium. They're probably watching football or baseball or something. Yeah. Look at this guy's expression. Something just happened, right? Yeah. And he's probably tweeting. I have no idea. But he's looking at the phone. This is a first date. <laughs> okay. Wow, they're at the museum in front of Masterpiece. They, I hope they're just Googling to understand the picture better. Okay, this is your friends having dinner. And I don't know how many of you have a mobile phone now. We all multitask, right? That's, that's the era that we live in. There's a good thing, there's a bad thing about this impact. But nevertheless, I'm gonna later show you here. I'm still sometimes at this stage. I'm gonna be 57 <coughs> in a couple of weeks. And I'm an old generation. You know, I felt so proud that I was able to type my master thesis on electric typewriter. Some of my friends, electric type, you know what that is? You put it on the word processing, you hook up your typewriter, it types automatically. Some of my friends who had to write their thesis on typewriter, even though they want to change one word or one sentence, they will not. Because they have, if it's a page three, that means the next 200 pages you have to retype. That's the generation I went through. You have to understand our mentality. And then you can be in a denial. It's not happening, right? My dad still uses his mobile phone, nothing but to call out. Rarely, but he only knows how to call us. The rest, he just answers. I said, Dad, you're in denial. Sometimes it's frustration, sometimes you feel deeply depressed, but eventually you need to integrate these technological changes into your life, into your work, whatever we have to do. So these are some interesting statistics. This is a worldwide. You can see that there are about 7.6 billion people in terms of internet users, social media, mobile, uh, statistics go about here. It's not important you remember all the changes here. But this is interesting. So this is the Philippines, about 106 million people roughly. Look at this. Can I go back? The stats are actually higher than worldwide in terms of internet use, social media, and all of those things. So are we ahead of the rest of the world in terms of how we incorporate this into education, into our workplace, or are we just fixated on the Facebook and what not, <laughs> right? I don't know. You know yourself. Now, so there are some traits, if I talk about the lead, oops, the leadership traits, that people, the leaders who rapidly adapt the change, accept the change, trying to integrate whatever they are doing, they have to be decisive, and, and sometimes you may not have all the information, but you have to make a decision which way you're gonna go. We don't have all the time we used to have in analyzing and making decisions. And you have to be willing to navigate that chaotic situation. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable, very disconcerting. But nevertheless, that's the will we live in. So, some statistics as to why that's important. Organizations where leaders have a very high book of capability tend to have a three point times more leadership strength in terms of bench of uh, senior managers and so on and so forth. So they really took some uh, They tend to be 20% better on financial performance. That should tell you something. That, that actually gets the CEO's attention very often. 
So let's look at industrial 4.0 very briefly because I'm sure Toots will talk quite a bit about it. So I'm not going to elaborate too much uh, on this. But this digitization, uh, industry 4.0, I like that fire. That's, that's a new word that I, I, I heard today. Automation, the rate is accelerating, there's no doubt about it. And there are many disruptions, and, and these drivers are impacting industries as well as uh, employment. If you look at some of the things that are happening, some things already happen. So mobile phone, uh, <laughs> geopolitical volatility, urbanization, all those things. There are some areas, for example, IoT, uh, for example, AI. Some of these things are happening. But also there are things that are happening in different places more at a more advanced and faster pace than some other places. At the uh, uh, Asian Management, we are now trying to look at blockchain to see how this is going to affect the whole industry. But the problem is, like many, many of these areas, we cannot find enough people who can actually share the expertise with, with our students. So how these things are affecting what we do and, and our conventional know-how, it ranges from business models, processes, products, skills, job losses. This is where sometimes people get stuck. You know, all this AI and machine learning will take our jobs away. We want to put our head into the sand and kind of pretend it's not happening. But we need to embrace this is going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that our uh, uh, a friend from um, uh, uh, BPO industry is here, but if you look at the BPO companies, those who are embracing the technology and thinking about how to actually upskill, upgrade, how they actually go from doing real menial BPO type of work to more intelligent uh, human interfacing work, they will survive, and a lot of co other companies who just think that their job, their growth will stay here forever, will not be able to make it. So I think we need to think about what are the impact of this new technology, especially AI and machine learning, all of those things, and how do we prepare our workforce, in particular, how do we prepare people coming into the workforce, whether it's uh, at the K-12 level, university level, or postgraduate level. Right, so I gave first version of this talk about a year and a half ago at a lot of international conference. When I was preparing for my talk, I decided to Google this. I went, real machine, that's all I typed. You know, sometimes you type and Google already gives you other options, you can just quickly click. So these are the options that I got. Take over the world. Goodness, replace humans. Replace doctors. I don't know why they picked doctors in particular. I have no idea. I'm sure they are good algorithms. Take my job. That's very personal. This is what people are looking for, and, and that's what Google thinks that I'm going to uh, search. But this day of whether Terminator 3 was a complete fiction to this, you know, you just heard that uh, robot talking, right, in one of the videos. It's very much there. In some cases, it's uh, a matter of figuring out is the economy there? Because sometimes, you know, labor is uh, still cheaper, more economical than hiring these uh, machines and robots. But sooner or later, economies of scale will work out, and, and it's going to be a new fact, it's going to be a new reality. I like this quote. So if you look at 2000, uh, you look at the Fortune 500. You look at 2017, over half of Fortune 500 companies disappeared. Half. That's worth half 250 companies, or some area out of 500, right? And if you look at the reason, it's a digital transformation. And that can take a lot of different forms. It's not just hardware, it's not just software. Sometimes it's a process, sometimes it's a business <coughs> model. But something that can be broadly categorized as a digital transformation is the reason for why all these companies here, even though when they were very successful. So what are the kind of industries that get affected? Of course, technology companies are number one under there. But you look at other industries, media, understandable retail, yes. I mean, there are malls in the US that, that have a nothing but tumbleweed. I think in the Philippines, the malls will be popular for a while because people want to go there because it's a cooler, right? Uh, but it's going to change. Uh, even in the Philippines, I know, um, um, what, what do you call it, um, online shopping is growing very, very rapidly. 
uh, financial services, of course, but education, even education. And this is this is what I'm trying to convince my colleagues here and abroad, because think about it. When I went to school, when you went to school, and the school is now, what has it changed? Not a lot compared to everything else. How they change? Schools haven't changed a lot. More or less, most schools have a classroom like this. You sit there. Maybe some fancier schools may have a, like a theater style, so it goes up. Maybe fancier schools have a more electronic stuff going on. A uh, little bit cool schools now have a bin bags, and you know they kind of have a different ways of engaging in classroom. But more or less, and then some schools use uh, <coughs> online. Some schools use a blended. But more or less, we teach in a similar way than when we went to school. Don't you think there's something wrong? Because youngsters, millennials, they learn very, very differently. Scary statistics. Their uh, attention span, how long do you think their attention span is? Millennials. Huh? Two minutes maximum. So there are now companies who are breaking down our lecture materials, learning materials into two minutes segments, whether it's uh, uh, exercise, whether it's a video, whether it's a simulation, they're breaking them into two minute chunks because that's all they can hold their attention. Scary. But none of us being taught how to teach in a digital age. <laughs> Right, so I'm going to do some class participation. You know, AIM is uh, famous for case teaching, right? If you didn't know, you know now. <laughs> so that requires what we call CP, class participation. Right? Toots actually teach at AIM, so he should be expert. So self-driving cars, again, we saw that little bit of uh, mention in the, uh, the video that we just saw. What are the kind of industry that this car will disrupt? Car industry, OK, what other? Driving school, okay, good. Steel industry, okay, that's good. What else? Security. Security in what way? Well, just the job of a guard, roving guard. Okay, the guards, okay, that's very good. What else? Delivery. Delivery is very good. Logistics and transportation, excellent. What else? Drivers? Actually, in the I mean, it, it doesn't affect it, many other countries, but in the Philippines, people, places like them, all these drivers will lose their job, right? Okay, so we can categorize these answers. Many of you have very good ideas. So there will be impact on some of the very directly related traditional value chain. Automobile manufacturing, you mentioned steel, for example, right? Repair jobs, public transportation, taxes, that's not very hard to imagine. And there's some what we call adjacent transportation <laughs> industry, package delivery, uh, transportation uh, supply chain, hotels, airline, parking garages. In some metropolitan areas, do you know up to 20% of the buildings could be parking related? So what, what are you going to do with all those? Okay, and there are so-called unrelated industries, which will be affected anyway. Insurance. It's not going to be insuring people. Maybe they have to insure cars as a driver and a car. I don't know. Something to think about. Retail industry. Energy sector. Somebody mentioned petrol, right? Media mm -hmm. entertainment. All of those things. Because you can actually watch your movie and watch your news while you're driving, like while you're in the car. That's the idea. And then there are some are totally unexpected. Real estate, I mentioned to you how the parking spaces play an important role. Healthcare, hopefully there won't be as many accidents, right? <laughs> Policemen, Policemen should think about how they're going to get all this extra money. I remember the first time I got pulled over. <laughs> and I want each of my drivers, and he passed over 100 persons that we got out of that trouble. And I said, you mean he just pulled you over for 100 pesos? And he said, yeah, but if you do that all day, it adds up. I said, OK. <laughs> I felt very guilty, but you know, I didn't even know what was going on. But what are they going to do? All these 
traffic uh, officers, education, you know, including driver's training, of course, you mentioned that. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about within the education sector. There are traditional, functional training that we will continue to do. They, they, they are important. But how do we actually leverage technology in our curriculum, in our teaching, in our learning? How do we actually use data analytics in our training? That's why AIM, if I can have a little bit of uh, PR, we launched the first data science program in the country, and one of the first in the region. Another thing that we need to do is there are more and more research coming out, in, including World Economic Forum, that the kinds of skills that 21st century requires are changing. More emphasis on a lot of soft skills. So this shows you, oops, this shows you the kind of skills that we need. A lot of intercultural cooperation, teamwork. Uh, at the same time, appreciation for liberal arts is increasing as well. Now, this is really interesting. I uh, apologize, this is not lining up correctly, but these are the kind of jobs that are going to be disappearing. Right? This is a study done by uh, NPR Will Your Job be done by a machine. It was done in 2015. Um, the numbers haven't changed a lot. Telemarketers, 99%. <laughs> Text preparers, I hope nobody here is an accountant. <laughs> Timing device assemblers, loan officers, these are, these are going to be disappearing. What are the kind of jobs not going to be as much affected? Mental health social workers, occupational therapists, choreographers, I like this one. Uh, makeup artists, I think if I am going to born again, I, I'm going to choose that one, that sounds cool. Okay? Now, you know, this is interesting. They suspect that 40% of judges' job will disappear. I, I don't know what would be here, but this is a Western data. One of the reasons this happens is a lot of simple cases, you know, traffic tickets and snow loans, they believe the machines will be able to make a lot less biased judgment. <laughs> because of your gender, occupation, the social class, uh, ethnicity, of course. So they think the simple matters can go to uh, some sort of AI machine and they will hand out the judgment. Okay, so this is a, a simple study of Harvard Business Review. One of our professors did this. This is to prove that this uh, human plus machine, this artificial intelligence is not just in certain industries. It's happening everywhere. It's happening in healthcare, it's happening in marketing, it's happening in supply chain. You know, the list goes on and on. And the, the professor who actually did this, a simple study, was surprised herself how widespread this is now in terms of how AI is affecting different industries. And this is another study uh, done in 2017. Uh, MIT Sloan Management uh, Review published this. It said there will be a huge impact of AI adoption across different industries, impact of offerings in five years, 63%, impact on processes, almost 60%. So if you think about your own organization, I don't know how, how some representatives thinking about how you have to change your processes. I have no idea. but. <laughs> It's going to affect everybody. I think that's the key message here. This is, can you see that? My classroom looked almost like that. When I was going to uh, university, if we raise our hand and ask the question, you know what professors would have said? I mean, rarely it happens. But if it happens, you know what professor said? How dare you interrupt the class? <laughs> it was a pretty one way. But what do we teach these kids? You know, 13 year old already making $200 million, uh, $80 million. What do we teach these kids? Dropouts. Actually, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking at the, what do you call it, um, CFO <coughs> conference. I forget the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Phoenix or something like that, right? Um, and. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about the same thing, CFOs, maybe they're a little bit better off than CPAs, but how do we actually prepare ourselves in this industry 4.0 era in terms of 
being able to add a value to the process, not making ourselves our jobs redundant. So let's take a very short case. I'm, I can talk about these cases on and on and on. There are a lot more examples. I just picked a few. Why? Because the collaboration, as I said at the very beginning, can accelerate innovation, create technology. Uh, it helps in terms of a new skill set. And also that uh, knowledge exchange can meet the both the business industry as well as uh, government and the policy making. So this is how it's changing. It used to be a lot of collaborations were very linear. Maybe it's the universities or maybe it's the centers, they generate knowledge and they find the ways of disseminating their knowledge. And then we had a for a while network model. So you develop your network partnerships and, and somehow it works faster than having a linear. But now what I really believe in what we call a triple helix. It, it's really the mutually intersecting interest and then three parties. Really it's the academia, industry, and the government okay, working together for all what we want. So if you look at the stages of this uh, triple helix model, first stage quite often is the government is taking a lead role. They sometimes put uh, resources such as uh, grant and funding, they put monies into universities, and a very good example is Singapore. Singapore is only 50, 51 years old, yeah? But the amount of money they put into education is unbelievable. A good friend of mine who used to be a dean at Ivy School in Canada, very good school, uh, he moved to Singapore, NTU, and I met him about two months after he took that job. I said, how is it going? He said, unbelievable. If I want to do anything, the money was there yesterday. He says, it's so refreshing. I said, good for you. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then there is a, a second stage where industry may take a uh, lead role, but the government and, and academia are supporting that role. But uh, what I really believe in, I keep doing the, pushing the wrong button, uh, is actually all three parties working together in an equal partnership. So here is an example. So Technical University of Munich worked with Audi. And what they did was a whole bunch of PhD students worked on various problems. And the local government, the way they provided support was they provided a free site for them to actually have a collaborative work. At the end of the day, uh, Audi got a lot of really cool ideas from uh, PhD students. Many of them end up finding jobs at Audi afterward, and, and it's all win-win situation. Mars had for many years this uh, mentality of uh, mutuality, so they all help each other. It's not just we winning, it's just us selling. So they went to Oxford and they wanted to understand how uh, different organizations can work together in different economic contests. And that research actually uh, generated a lot on economics of mutuality, and now it's a hot word, it's in a sharing economy. You know, how can we actually find out with Situations. Imperial College, I'm not going to look at anything else, but have you think about this. When they work together in this uh, PLC form, they were able to generate 455 million pounds of, of uh, uh, fund to be able to help all the collaborations and innovation that they are doing because they work together with the different industry partners. Siemens work uh, with the universities all over the world, in fact. Uh, this is just one example in terms of the Technology University of Berlin, but they work with MIT, and, and all these uh, collaborations are continuing to happen because Siemens realized it really helps them, but it also helps them to look good because it's also helping universities as well, right? What is AIM doing? So many of you know Dado Barato, right? So we went to Dado. Um, it just happened overnight uh, because I was having dinner with him one evening and I asked him to help because he's sort of like uh, Steve Jobs of the Philippines in a way, right? Or Bill Gates of, of the Philippines. I said, you can be inspiration to young people. Can you help us with innovate, uh, incubators? So he did. Ah, forgot. And we got the funding from TY State. So thank you very much, uh, Philippine government. So we got uh, initial funding to support our incubator for two years. And then we also got help from um, 
Acer Computing, uh, Mr. Stan Shi, who is a uh, co-founder and chairman of Acer Computer, it sits on our board, and he gave a supercomputer, and with that supercomputer, we uh, created a lab called Analytics Computing and Complex Systems. We house the fastest supercomputer in the country and one of the fastest in Southeast Asia, second to Singapore. But again, this is a collaboration. <coughs> and they are now working with, and this one is at the initial stage, I'll be very honest with you, and I'm really hoping that it comes through. Uh, we're working with the financial institutions, including bank and fund management. We're looking, uh, working with uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, conglomerate, I'm not going to name, manufacturing company, some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, I'm just giving you a very much a taste of it. This one you will appreciate. This fund management uh, company has a super, super uh, brilliant portfolio manager, but he's retiring, so they're panicking. They're trying mm -hmm. to think when he's gone, who is going to be filling his hole? So they want us to develop algorithm, AI model, that will replicate everything that these guys know. <laughs> Interesting, right? So this is what we believe in. Industry is looking for value. Whether it's going to be a financial value, whether it's going to be innovation. Uh, government would like to make uh, a difference. Is that right? I hope so. <laughs> You want to better their lives. And in academia, we're looking for something novelty. We want to generate knowledge. We want to do research. So let's find the commonality to see how we can all work together. So if you look at the Philippine industry, I think we are moving. Is it moving fast enough? Not, I'm, I, you know, I have some talents, I have some good characteristics, but one thing I don't have is a patience. I always say that. <laughs> and I don't think it's moving fast enough. So some uh, development, 60% increase in government spending, improved student-teacher ratio, but that's still very, very high. K-12, when I first arrived in the Philippines in 2015, there was a K-12 discussion still going on. And for the life of me, I could not understand why people were fighting about it. That was so obvious to me. I'm so glad it happened. But now we still have to work on a lot of other issues. So there are many, many reasons in terms of why we need to uh, improve quality by increasing quantity to begin with. Yeah? But it's not just about improving quantity, like you know, going from um, 10 to 12 years or putting a little bit of money. It's really trying to understand what are the needs of 21st century. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of soft skills, communication, problem solving, working in teams, collaboration, but it's also this entrepreneurship and curiosity and, and things like that that are really important rather than sort of doing, you know, memorize this and you'll take an exam. Yeah? And some of the Nordic countries actually use entrepreneurship as a basis of their education ever since they joined kindergarten. So you can imagine how the whole curriculum will be so different if you put entrepreneurship at the center of it. And you can imagine what will be the impact when these kids grow up. Yeah? It's not, and then entrepreneurship is not just having a mom and pop store of own. Sometimes when you work for large organizations, or corporations is entrepreneurship. How you become an innovator within the organization, that's also entrepreneurial spirit. And the famous university uh, in, in the U.S. for entrepreneurship is the Baxter College. Uh, and that's, that's how they redefined entrepreneurship, actually. That, that very much applies to all units, including government. Right, so uh, raising quality is going to be a key issue, starting with the basic education. Having said that, what do we mean by basic? Need to be changed. So, of course, uh, literacy and numeracy are important, but how are we going to adapt what we teach, one, and how we teach? Because this new generation of millennials are not going to learn best if we teach any materials, whether it's basic or not, the way we learn. And the problem is, we old folks, sometimes it's harder to imagine. So you need to be really creative. You need to think outside of your box and, and 
uh, tools such as design thinking can be very helpful um, because you really need to be able to think outside your comfort zone. So what are the kind of things that we need to think about? Learning to learn. I really emphasize this because, you know, I have uh, how many years of education? Two years of master's, two, four years of PhD, and, and so, so forth. That doesn't mean my training, my uh, learning is finished. This is now era of what we call lifelong learning. You always have to learn whatever there is coming out. So at school, we cannot just teach stuff. We need to teach our youngsters how to learn by themselves. It's very important. How to learn fast. Because if you take three years to learn something, by the time you finish learning, believe me, there is something else for you to learn. And maybe that's one way of learning all the time, but hopefully not. Learning how to uh, t taking advantage of the technology. And this is getting better and better and more and more important, learning by doing. So instead of just learning from book, you give our students immersed experience. Immersion is becoming more and more important. So that means, I'm sorry, <coughs> there's no free goods. There's no free service. Everything takes money. So we have to think about where are these resources going to come from. And it's a tough question, but we have to think about it. We have to train teachers. You know, what's the average of teachers' uh, lifespan? At least 30 years, 35 years? You know, things have changed multiple times. So how do we continuously retrain them? So they are always ready to teach young people who actually <laughs> demand very different kind of education and training. How do we actually review curriculum? And I have a one criticism of, uh, of government, for example. So AIM is uh, autonomous. We have international character, so we don't have to follow all the CHED regulations. But we do, because we are a good, good institution. We want to be a good player. And when we were applying for a new program, I looked at the list of requirements, okay? And the thing that shocked me was you need to have actually X number of books in the library. <laughs> so I actually called my librarian and said, what should be that? I mean, you can have a thousands and hundreds of millions of thousands of books and journals and articles electronically. Why do you need this X number of books? He says, that's the requirement. <laughs> we really need to think outside the box. And, you know, it's quite possible these were very effective and valid requirements, but if we don't continuously update what we expect from our institutions, that's where many, many institutions will be stuck. So we ended up buying a bunch of books, but by the time books arrived from America, I said, they probably need a new books. <laughs> because that's how quickly things are changing, especially in this space. Uh, so we need to review the curriculum, we need to review what we're teaching, all of those things. Uh, and as I said, immersion, project-based learning, learning by doing, things like that will become so much more important, but research and innovation. Now, if you look at top universities in the world, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, their revenues, if you look at the revenues, tuition revenue accounts for only maybe 20 some percentage to 30 some percentage. <coughs> the rest comes from endowment. So Harvard uh, University just sent out a uh, notice because they closed their fundraising uh, campaign is how much they raised just now, the campaign they just finished of about a year earlier, $9.6 billion. <coughs> okay. Schools like AIM, our operating <coughs> expenses, how much is a tuition playing a role? almost 
we don't get anything from the government because we are a private institution. Why? We don't have a lot of private sectors helping us. So we rely 100%, almost 100%, 97% on tuition revenue to run the place. Think about what we can do versus institutions like Harvard, MIT, we have a billion of endowment where they can invest their money in research. Think about it. Okay, so we now at some point need to move from quantity to quality and what it takes for us to start thinking about quality is very, very important um, issue. So I'm going to go through this quickly because uh, many of you will be more familiar with them than, than myself, but I, I personally believe university is not an answer to everybody, or for everybody. You want to think about where the mentorship is going to be uh, playing a role, uh, even apprenticeship, vocational education, or technical training, all those things are very, very important, but we do need to invest in those kind of things because they do play a critical role in complementing lifelong learning. So we need to think about how different units need to all work together in partnership. I'm giving you some examples here. So in my final thoughts, this whole idea of education, innovation, uh, especially in this era of VUCA Industry 4.0, you have to look at it as an ecosystem. Yeah? Um, ADB President Nakao uh, published an article in a newspaper some time ago he talked about 10 things that he thinks is most important for the development of the country. He put infrastructure as number one. And then number two, what he put uh, is a healthcare sector and education. And I cannot agree more. Healthcare is important because they depend on the basic, our basic survival depends on healthcare system, right? But education is really what could make a difference to the development of the country. Uh, as I said a lot, we need to think about the teaching, research, knowledge generation, how different parties can work together. So that's where I am a strong advocate of a triple helix model. And we need to think about the role of university, educational sector, government, industries, private corporations, uh, multilateral organizations, we all need to work together. Especially the Philippines, if you want to make a difference in terms of all the things we're trying to do, you know, growth rate of 6% is wonderful, but we can do a lot better in terms of uh, closing the gap between top and the bottom, bottom of pyramid. Uh, we talk about inclusive growth a lot, but I, I think the way we can actually make a huge impact is if you find the ways to work together to make a difference. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gan, for that very wonderful presentation. Uh, at this point, I would like to recognize the presence of our Honorable Representative Sagani Amatong, 3rd District of Zampang, Patel Norte. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, we are ready to entertain questions uh, on uh, the presentation of Dr. Gan. Uh, but before you shoot your questions, uh, please identify yourself first and uh, the organization where you come from. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Ferdy Pasion from the Committee on Overseas Workers Affairs. Uh, right now, uh, some of our overseas workers are already uh, experiencing uh, uh, the effects of uh, fire. And uh, many of them have lost their jobs, actually. And uh, is it possible that because of these developments, uh, there will be a, a more, <coughs> on the government side, a move towards, uh, for example, uh, providing a universal income for everyone? Because I'm afraid that uh, many Filipinos will be losing their jobs when robots <laughs> take over. Artificial intelligence. Right now, uh, PLDT. When you call PLDT, there's no human answering on the other line. It's already uh, an artificial intelligence machine. So, uh, uh, what will be the effects of this? And uh, you mentioned about something about blockchain. Uh, how will this uh, blockchain currencies uh, come into the picture? Uh, will it will it be uh, 
uh, helpful or uh, will it disrupt the uh, uh, financial sector as we know? So. So universal income, I cannot answer that. Um, perhaps uh, mm -hmm. our um, esteemed guests from the government sector can answer that better. But I think I think uh, what I would like to do, and we are getting into online teaching, online learning, because one of the target audience that I really like to address is this overseas workers. Uh, whether they're losing jobs or not, uh, the rate is going to get uh, faster, but I do know they need to be retrained. They need to be retrained. Uh, they are perfectly capable of uh, learning from their local institutions, and there are plenty of uh, online programs they can pick up. But also, as a Korean who left Korea in 1984, I, I lived abroad longer than I actually lived in Korea, but there's something about Asian, there's something about learning from your own people, something about being able to relate to your culture, your your uh, geopolitical, economic, social environment. I think that, that does play a role. So we want to be able to actually address this market in particular so that we can do our share of training for, for this group. So I, I think that is a very important sector. And uh, uh, Professor Lee Kwan, who is the retired dean of AIM, has been doing some research on uh, OFWs. And I actually had a brief conversation with her to see if there is any government agency who would be interested in providing funding for us to develop materials that we can actually use to um, to target our own school <coughs> more so that, that's what I want to share with you. Any, anybody from government, maybe? Later. Oh, blockchain. Oh, blockchain. Um, it, it's not just the, the currency or the money, actually, it's the whole technology behind it. Um, so it's definitely something that we need to get into, but just like a data science, I don't think a public, general public, has a clear understanding of the, what it is, first of all, and the implication of it. Uh, and the, the blockchain technology is going to disrupt so many things. And as, as the introduction briefly uh, talked about, I'm an independent direct, director of Security Bank, and it's only five, six, or six largest banks as compared to BPO, BDI, we have very small market share. But we're talking about it constantly, how, how we can actually use some of this technology to be able to make a step change in what we're trying to do. So, yeah, definitely. But I, I think the first step is we need to have a more general education <coughs> about what they did. So people will be able to think about it in, in more intimate ways, the implications for themselves, for the organizations and companies. But we also need people who can actually do this with the expertise. Because I, I spoke with many, many uh, people who claim to be data scientists, who claim to be blockchain specialists, but uh, I can tell you. That's right. Actually, they have no clue what's happening. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Geraldine from the Bill Drafting. Um, so, regarding the senior citizen, um, do you have any studies on how are they regard this industrial revolution? And as much as education is life. And then, uh, which means that it, it does not only apply to young ones, to adult persons, but all those for those who are already in their uh, uh, last phase of life. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I teach my colleagues whenever we go to restaurants, because when you become 62 or 63, you get a senior discount card, right? 60? 60, right, so generous, I can't wait. I just wait three more years, I get my senior discount card. It's wonderful. But I think, first of all, mandatory retirement needs to go, in my view. Because the life expectancy is getting so long, people's minds are so active. So why do we have to impose they must retire? You know, it all should depend on lifestyle, what he's looking for. It all depends on the skill sets and how much 
continuous lifelong learning that people are interested in, how much energy you have, how healthy you are, all these things should play a factor in deciding how long one can stay in the workforce, right? But it also means that we gotta have a variety of sources where, you know, senior people can go and learn without feeling, without going into a classroom, everybody's looking at grandma thinking, what are you doing here? You know, I think we need to change the culture, we need to change the environment, and provide an ecosystem for senior people until there will be uh, changes in the legal retirement age uh, where people feel they're actually ready to have a second career. I, I just love the idea, second career, third career. In fact, there's a study in a healthy environment, one should reinvent themselves three times. Meaning, you actually have three different careers. So you may start as a teacher, you might have become an entrepreneur, and then you may become priest or you know whatever. So that that is what they expect now. You everybody will go through three, not just related, but three different careers. So, so that's why we need a lot of personal self-professional development and we need to think about what would be our transferable skills. And a lot of skill sets that are valued, you know, creativity, analytical thinking, complex problem solving, working in collaboration, all these things are transferable skills. So that's my answer. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think are the top three things that the government must do to take the most uh, advantage of uh, the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution? Yeah. Or if there's any particular area where in uh, legis the parliament or legislat legislators should look into? I think the first of government, I know government has money. So many people <coughs> tell me so. <laughs> so I think the money needs to be spent in areas where it matters. Okay. Uh, education, training young people, training young people so they are not just good at on Facebook on mobile phone, but they actually know how to use technology. You know, five, six year old can code these days. So where they can actually learn this properly in the Philippines. Uh, I think in my experience, I've been here just uh, just shy of four years. In my experience, government very slow in developing partnerships, opening up their wallets, and, and, and being able to see the world differently. Um, I know you need to make sure that your money is hard on taxpayers' money are wisely spent, but if you don't try, you will not know what works and what doesn't. And I even heard that sometimes some high rank government officials don't want to sign any papers because if you don't make any decisions, they will not be accused of making any wrong decisions. <laughs> so I think, I think we need to have a culture overall that a failure or even two failures is not the end of the world. Give people a chance to try something new and different, experiment, give them a playground. If you see an opportunity, jump, rather than having to tick 100 different boxes before you make a decision. So I think resources are really, really important uh, because there are so many things we can do just putting our energy and heads together, but the rate at which we can do uh, implement these things, it takes resources. So I think government needs to develop a lot of partnerships and all of those things, but perhaps changing mentality. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, let us give uh, Dr. G. Kim Dang another round of applause. And now to discuss on the opportunities and challenges in the fourth industrial revolution, let us all give a warm welcome to Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, Senior Research Fellow of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you know, it's a bit 
as I talk about the fourth industrial revolution, the overarching idea here is really there's fusion happening. It's kind of interesting when you say fusion, uh, you know, or even if I work full time as a senior research fellow at PIBS, as was mentioned by Ji Kyung, I also have my foot, a little bit of my foot on, at the AIM, and a little bit of my foot in many places, uh, which, which is what, in a way, what we should be doing. We should try to be sure that we're, we're always expanding our networks. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, we tend to be living in our own little worlds. We tend to talk with each other, the same sets of people we talk with <laughs> over and over again. But anyways, um, two years ago, I, a, a team of fellows uh, comprising myself, Dr. Serafica, uh, Dr. Paqueo, and Dr. Urbeta, decided to, to work together and since last year work also with two universe, uh, De La Salle University computer scientists, Dr. Dadios and Dr. Kulaba, uh, to do a scoping study on the fourth industrial revolution. And it's now available on the PIDS website. Now, so the scoping studies laying, describing what's go, what's happening and what are what seem to be where 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 things are going, not just in the world but in the particularly in the country. No? And um, so I have been tasked somehow. I don't know why. I among the four, I was sort of selected to be always the the, the face behind the, the study. And so I've been. I think most of the public presentations about this study and either specifically on, on the role of government and what we should really be doing. For some reason, I've been the one disseminating the, the study, you know. Um, uh, I don't know, I don't know exactly, no, I think they, maybe they just ganged up on me, no. Uh, anyways, I'll be, as, as well, I'll be showing the outline, this outline, uh, I'll be describing the, we've already started to hear from the videos earlier and the talk of Jake Young. Uh, about the fourth industrial revolution, which we um, uh, refer to as fire at the IBS. It was actually Dr. Paqueo, Vic Paqueo, who, who coined the term. No? Uh, I think I saw a, a, a media article that said that I was the one who coined the term. It was not me, it was Dr. Paqueo. No? But Vic Paqueo has been a world uh staff for a long period of time after he, he was teaching at the at the UP School of Economics de decades ago. No? Then, so when he retired, uh, he started working with us at PIDS as a visiting fellow because he's supposed to be retired, so we cannot pay him anymore. And besides, he, I think he earned already a lot in the World Bank, so, <laughs> so we pay him one peso a year no? just to work with us. And we're, he's been a wonderful uh, uh, co-researcher. Anyways, um, uh, so let me just, as I try to discuss where, where the context uh, of fire and the likely effects of this of the frontier technologies, although we heard a little bit about that already from the discussions of Ji Kyung. Um, I will be also addressing some of the issues that was raised about, you know, the, uh, are, is there a need for us to do experimenting about, you know, uh, universal basic income and things like that. But anyways, um, so as I said, I'll be first uh, looking at um, the, just looking at the entire context from this perspective that as, as far as the Philippine economy has, is concerned, we have, uh, if you look at the historical performance, even way back since the 1960s, we've had a lot of booms and busts, no? and many of these were being a result not only of um, internal political events, if you look at the 1980s, early 80s, uh, one political event changed the, the economic performance. And then there were also regional shocks. You had the Asian financial crisis, and then in 2008, the global financial crisis. And even if you look at not just the macroeconomic performance, but even inflation, there were all of these ups and downs. No? But now, there's a lot more um, uh, positive outlook about the world today, in large part because technology is really changing the landscape. No? And there is there is a sense that when, when we were looking at using technology, there's really improving lives. Um, so uh, we there, there are what I call as buoyant, very positive expectations about what will ha be happening 
in the world in the next uh, few years no? and uh, even decades to come. All right. So, but anyways, historians of science have pointed out that we have had many developments, especially in the use of technology that have signaled new ways of living, starting with the invention of fire, you know, developing agriculture, using the wheel, the rise of cities, and the development of manufacturing and trade. And um, in the case of industrial pro production, as was already uh, suggested earlier, we've had three periods called the uh, industrial revolutions where we've improved industry by migrating from established uh, production methods to utilizing cutting edge technologies. First, we used steam and water power in the 18th century, then a century later, electricity and assembly lines. Then starting more or less in the 1970s, we had the third industrial revolution which involved computerization. Now we are in the era of the fire and what makes this revolution a revolution is not the technologies themselves because some of the technologies, robots, computers, wireless connectivity, digital platforms, they've been there already. No? And what's just special about this period is that we are getting to use these technologies a lot more to interact with each other in ways that we have not done before. And Klaus Schwab uh, said that this period is fusing what's known as the physical, the digital, and biological worlds. And while there is no universally agreed definition of what are the underlying technologies that are part of the fire, commonly we think of uh, things like artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, Internet of Things, uh, and uh, but uh, you know many of the different studies across uh, have been identifying very various technologies. Now, now the, uh, let me just explain just some of these underlying technologies because there's so many. You know. uh, 3D printers. What 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 are 3D printers all about? Three-dimensional printers. So you're, for instance, in the case of we don't even need to buy any more organs you know, because we keep hearing people buying organs of people but in the, in the future we can get, get 3D print, printed transplantable organs in a process called bioprinting and now we are uh, we not just going to print body parts but even engine parts, cars, houses and much more would you believe you just google 3D printed hotel there is one in the Philippines, many of you didn't even know. It's in Pampanga. Okay. So there is all of there are all of these applications already happening even in the Philippines. Just as we some of us might think, this is still not happening in the Philippines. It is. It's happening. No? How about Internet of Things? It's uh, about the, the devices connected to the internet, trillions of sensors communicating with these devices and with one another. Um, you know, and things like uh, if you're going to enter a, an IoT area where you have elevators uh, being monitored for the current status and possibly, you know, uh, even predicting likely defects in some parts of the elevator so that before they, they, they get uh, into problems, you could, you could actually address them already. And then we've, we've heard of things like uh, uh, robotics. No? Uh, building cars, uh, assisting even in surgery. In some in some hospitals in the Philippines, we are actually using during surgery robots. It's already happening, even in the Philippines. Don't think it's only advanced economies. We're already using them now. Uh, and of course, you hear of things like artificial intelligence. No? And artificial intelligence, the whole idea started with trying to build a machine that has intelligence. But for you to do that, you have to understand how, how does the human brain, how, do, how does the human brain work? No? So that was the initial idea when, uh, when, when we develop uh, artificial in in intelligence. And many of these things are now getting put together into various things like, as was mentioned earlier, driverless cars, and even now voice assistants. No? Uh, you use your phone, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, whatever you want to do happens. Or shopping bots. Uh, or to be, to be more specific, I think it was already shown earlier by Jit Young when she was Googling as she was entering in her search engine some words. No? Uh, immediately, there is a suggestion on what are the likely words you're going to use next. So that's called an auto, 
autocomplete feature on your mobile phones. That's actually also AI. It's being, AI is powering all of that. So with these uh, recommendations that you get in websites when you start buying, buy clothing, music, household goods, they will tell you, customers who purchase this also purchase this. <laughs> okay? So they'll give you recommendations. Uh, how about you know, if you have an iPhone X and you use your phone, your, your face to, to, you know, so that's also AI at work, uh, facial recognition, among other things. I remember when I visited uh, India and I took a photo uh, uh, of myself, but uh, near the Taj Mahal, but in that I did not have an, a way of, of immediately uploading the photo in Instagram, but as soon as I went to my hotel for four hours later because it's quite a distance from the Taj Mahal to the ho to the hotel. Anyways, immediately I noticed, oh, it already knew I was in the Taj Mahal. No? <laughs> so it's, it can recognize things. Again, that's AI at work. All right. So, uh, and there are so many other things, genetic, biotechnologies, ge geoengineering, even computing technologies. Many of us think that you know you need to do use your computer, etc. You know, physically, but then there are things that you can say you can use cloud computing technologies now. Uh, so there's so much happening, I'm telling you, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality. There's so you know I can move go go on and on. But anyways, I let me just uh, give you now, an idea that, unfortunately, because of time constraints, uh, I'd like to just say that while all of these technologies may seem, may, may give us a lot of good, there are also risks. Okay. For instance, when you're using more artificial intelligence, there's a possibility that there could be technological unemployment. Some people will lose their jobs. Okay. There could be possibility that the ones will be ahead will be those who know how to use technology, but some people are not able to or they don't want to use technology. I remember when my mom was still alive uh, and we, we just had a, uh, what was it, a, a, uh, a television no? with uh, your, your remote control. She would never want to use the remote. She said, come on, we don't want to use it because she just did not like to use all of these gadgets. So some people choose also not to learn the use of technologies. So what are, what's going to happen, again, that's the question that you're posing, what will happen to some people who might be left behind? That's where the problem lies when you have all of these technologies because there will be a, a very strong risk of inequalities. Lots of changes, business models, value chains, really changing so much, disruptions. But there's also this idea of Know, personal privacy being violated because every time you use technology, you're actually telling someone something about yourself. Okay, and while we do have now data privacy act, but how much, how much of the data privacy act is actually being implemented really across the government and business sectors? You wonder. Even if you have the laws, no matter what, you might keep having so many laws, but how much of those are really being implemented? Because the fact remains, I often wonder why I keep getting all of these text messages from, from various people I do not know and are selling certain things. Apparently, my number is being sold by someone. Right? So that's an invasion of my privacy. <coughs> but of course, somebody will say, well, maybe you take a box somewhere that said I can, they can give your number to someone. Maybe, but you know, you just, how many of you bother to read the, the box? <laughs> You know, you just keep saying, yes, 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 <laughs> when you're going to use. In fact, uh, I remember when I was also teaching in another university in, uh, in Indonesia, I told them something like, okay, try to guess my age. Many of you were kind of uh, startled to hear that Ji Kyung is 57, no? but anyways, uh, <laughs> even me. <laughs> uh, when I was asking my students in Indonesia, can you guess my age? Some, some of them said, um, 62? They said, ah, you probably don't want to get a good grade. No? Uh, then another student said, 27. Ah, you want to get a good grade. But anyways, I, I was discussing this issue about estimation because as, as a statistician, that's what data is about, no? trying to estimate. 
giving a number. And then at the end of the class, they were all saying, so sir, what, what's your age? Uh, nobody will find out. It's all in my passport, but I won't tell you. And then the following day, they were all laughing. I was saying, why were you laughing? We Googled it. Your name is somewhere. And we know what, how, how old you are. Okay, anyways. <laughs> but that shows you, in a way, <laughs> things are really changing, okay? So here, I, I have videos here, but I won't go through all of these dif different videos of different technologies. But I'd like to Let's show see. you what just maybe something. Can you go? Sorry. Uh, I'd just like to go to sorry, maybe just one video. Google Assistant. Can, you, can, can somebody play it? Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Is that happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Imagine that's a Google Assistant, mm -hmm. AI. Uh -huh. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Can you imagine? That was a real call you just heard. A real call. Okay, anyway, so I, I won't go through all the different videos here, but you can, if you'd like to get a copy of this, it can be made available to everyone. So I think some of these things, the point here is that the world is really changing so much in the use of technology. No? Many of the technologies people dreamed of in the 1950s have already become a reality. Of course, we don't yet have flying cars, but we are testing driverless cars, in, uh, even in Singapore. And we have robots, we have uh, blockchain, big data, nanotechnologies, 3D printing, to name a few. No? And uh, frontier technologies, however, are, are yielding some uncertainties and risks in their use. Even the late physicist Stephen Hawking suggested that AI is giving an existential threat to, to humanity. Uh, the Nobel Prize laureate Joseph Stiglitz even warns that current inequalities might become larger. With every use of technology, so we should be realizing that some personal intuition is happening. Technology may affect jobs, possibly in three forms. Technology can either replace human labor, or new jobs can be created because of technology, or third, jobs can be complemented by technology. How this is all going to play out, still nobody, anybody's guess. But a recent study of the ILO uh, suggested that there are half of jobs that are at high risk of getting affected in the Philippines alone. Uh, and for our BPOs, the estimate was about 90% of jobs going to get, get affected from automation. Uh, and repetitive tasks, all of these risks, of course, we're not really scaring you, but we're just telling you that that's their estimate. Even, and even if they say at risk, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that all the jobs will get lost. I keep telling people the example of a bank teller. A bank teller in, in the 1990s when we had ATMs, everybody was afraid that oh no, all the bank tellers will disappear. They did not. They have even more bank tellers now. And the, ha the story is because bank tellers are given extra tasks. So it's not the jobs themselves that will disappear, but maybe the tasks, repetitive tasks. So the question is, what are we doing to make sure that people are easily flexible to handle new tasks and responsibilities in their jobs? Okay. Of course, we also know that there are many changes happening right now. Some people are already losing their jobs, but there is also reshoring, reshoring that might be happening. And... Um, MIT professor David Autor argues that while several studies are suggesting a lot of this machine substitution, but this might be overstated. Okay? And uh, 
However, he did also warn that even if automation will not reduce the quantity of jobs, it may affect the quality of jobs that are available. So in other words, human capital investments, as was mentioned by Ji Kyung, are extremely crucial for the, the, having the core of any long-term strategy for producing future skills. Various technologies uh, are likely going to offer exciting opportunities for us, no? but we do note, note that as far, as far as the bank teller is concerned, it does not necessarily mean the technology will replace the job. Maybe some aspects, some, some tasks in a job. And for old, moreover, technological feasibility does not necessarily mean it will get adopted. Because some industries may adopt it, and because it might be very expensive to adopt new technologies, so some industries may, may still be, in fact, even in Industry 1.0, not even 4. Point, not even 3.0. But nonetheless, Stiglitz warns that governments are and are not quite uh, fast enough. Also, even markets are not fast enough to to understand what's going on. Okay. So we need to be, be much more, uh, uh, we, we need to see what's, what's really happening uh, because if we're, if we're looking at all these changes in, 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 uh, in the job market alone, we, why we will be, we're seeing already that there's, it's happening, it's starting to happen across industry, all of these uh, big changes. Um, and, and these are giving us a lot of opportunities uh, particularly for what are known as the sustainable development goals, agriculture, healthcare, the environment. So many things that we are that are um, that we're, we'd like to focus on, we can really use technologies to improve things. But unfortunately, the World Economic Forum's recent examination of 100 countries suggests that the Philippines is not at the forefront of things. Uh, they, they look at the different drivers of production and, and structures of production. And so far, the Philippines is here, no? There's Philippines somewhere here. Yeah, here, okay? So it, it, we, do, we do have improved economy, economic growth, but unfortunately, there are uh, problems for us as far as our ND. We're not really spending as much. We're not spending as much in education. So this is this is our main problem. If, as pointed out by Ji Kyung, we're not able to 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 get very good rankings. That's already a problem. Okay. Our human capital investments are are quite poor. Of course, you might say, well, now we've uh, started off already now having more investments by having uh, you know uh, uh, free college education. But that is not necessarily a, a good thing. Free college. We at PIDS wonder, uh, not just wonder, there are some of us who suggest that uh, that, that might not be an equitable thing to have. Uh, but anyways, the, the innovation landscape, the entire ecosystem, there are a little bit of problems because not a lot of firms are, are product innovators, are doing product innovation. We're more adopting technologies. And uh, about less than half are, have in our recent survey at BIDS, about a uh, thousand firms, uh, just about 40% of firms have been in innovation active as of 2015. And many of these means in these firms say that the, re the reason why they are innovating is because of human resources, and generally, uh, those that are innovating are the one are the big firms. In other words, our MSMEs, which are quite I, how, mu how much of it is is is, is uh, they are contributing to our, our 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 jobs. MSMEs are generally not innovating as much as large firms, and in part because they have less resources. So are we are we really giving enough to of a climate for people to make the changes? Ask people, ask innovators, why do you innovate and what, what are your sources of innovation? They tend to work only within the establishments or they talk with their clients. But the partnerships are not very strong across industries or even 
with government and research in university uh, institutes and academia. In other words, the innovation ecosystem is still in need of nurturing. Okay, and um, many of them keep saying that there are cost factors, there are also knowledge factors, market factors that are hindrances to to, in, to ensuring that we have a, a improved innovation. We have set up some governance factors like competition uh, that will hopefully enable more innovation, but look at all our rankings even as far as ASEAN is concerned for global, the Global Innovation Index, we're kind of midway, not even midway, uh, we're, not, we're not quite there no? um, as far as uh, the innovation ecosystem is concerned. Uh, and uh, so what, can, what should we be doing? We, we, we tend to point out that government's role is really that of a, a gardener. A good gardener that prepares the ground, nurtures the soil, removes weeds, and waters the plant. What do we mean by preparing the ground? Um, well, we, we say that skills are going to be important. Okay? So we need to make sure that right now we have like Lego blocks, supposedly, you know, that when we have Lego blocks, you can build many things. But how many of us are really, even the current educational system, are we setting themselves, setting our future job market for the right skills they need in case they go from one career to another? As we hear the cries now of our overseas workers who are losing our, their jobs, how, what are the mechanisms by which they can retool? Singapore has had a Singapore skills, uh, future skills mechanism by which they give uh, some some money and then they can do mass, uh, some kind be, be part of an open online course and, and reskill themselves. But do we have that kind of? Uh, I think we gave that opportunity for the teachers in the K to 12 transition, but beyond the teachers. And I think even the teachers themselves, they were complaining if they wanted to, to retool getting scholarships, they were also getting delayed uh, scholarships, uh, stipends. No? So there's so much that we're doing, unfortunately. I think there's so many stumbling blocks. And even the teachers themselves, if we're going, if they're going to be, if, the, if we want to train people, if, but the, the trainers themselves, the teachers themselves, must be the models of lifelong learning. So how many of our teachers are really, or do they have enough time to actually learn more? Key skill for learning really should be not just that they should learn, but they should unlearn and relearn fast enough. Okay. And the World Economic Forum suggests that there are all of these lifelong skills, certain 21st century skills that we should be promoting. Uh, how about nurturing the soil? r and unfortunately, so low. Among ASEAN member states, we're spending about 0.2% for GDP, of GDP. Way below what is suggested by, as, uh, by UNESCO as a benchmark for r and spending of 1%. And much of that spending, by the way, is even coming from government. So the private sector isn't doing its job either to, to do r and so we can always keep saying our government is not doing its job, but neither, I mean, there are a few people in the private sector doing their job, but then I think uh, there, uh, we need to, to, to see the future for where it's, it's going. No? DTI, DOST, DICT, we're now doing many things, well and good, but I also wonder how much of all of our work is really complementing each other? I really wonder. Because in terms of actual impact, Ji Kyung was saying that government is always trying to look for impact. But if you're doing little things here, little things here, little things here, overall, what does it do? I really wonder. Certainly, the ICT is, is, is right that we're, we're in, in trying to set up a, a better <coughs> ICT infrastructure because that's going to be extremely important. But in addition, we need to, to get out of the 
right now I'm a bit worried because you know when you have all of these repetitive skills still uh, which will be automated how much of, of fostering are we doing even for what's what, what's not just you know of course DPI is focusing on, on industry and production but then I'm also wondering about the creative economy you know you have you have uh, creative industries like film which is changing rapidly our artists and even our scientists are part of the creative economy but how much how much promotion are we doing for fostering the creative industries? All right. Um, now, I, I also know that DTI and other and DOSD, we're all trying to have catch up and, and, uh, and, and, and um, unfortunately, there is uh, a sense that if you're very far on the innovation landscape, it's possible that we may make mistakes along the way and if you're far from the technological frontier there you need a lot of complementary factors to be able to make sure that you we will get somewhere people always say oh china is very good now but you know china is good today especially in automation largely because in 1978 deng xiaoping called jimmy carter and said i want 10,000 scholarships in their best schools that was 1978. But right now, how many, how much spending are we doing to, to bring our current sets of even grad, undergraduates to eventually read? Because, you know, having them get their graduate education overseas. I know when I was in Malaysia, I was, I was kind of jealous with my Malaysian friends. They were being sent to, to Cambridge to study. And I said, oh my gosh, if I did not get my own scholarship in Stony Brook, I don't know how I would have managed to get my graduate education overseas. What are the programs for us to actually invest in our people? It's it's gonna take a while, and, and I don't think catching up, leapfrogging. I'm, I am a bit worried that you know we can always dream of leapfrogging, but leapfrogging always assumes all complementarities are all there. Um, this is the main problem for us in government, removing weeds, making sure that we have a better regulatory framework. <coughs> Doing business uh, indicators are not, we're not quite there. <laughs> FBI rankings, even among our ASEAN neighbors, we're not, we're not very good, we're not able to attract as much. I'm sad to say though, because part of it is there might be something somewhere <laughs> that, 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 that we're not, I mean, of course, it, government, some government offices are doing their job, but then maybe the only thing is we're not networking as much to, to have a whole of government approach. And that brings me to one of my last slides, which is if we want to really make a dent, I think we need to have a, to put our act together. We cannot, I mean, I know that even here in Congress, sometimes the committees, you don't talk with each other, <laughs> right? I mean, it's sad, you're in an, one institution and you don't talk. Can you imagine now talking with other people from other government offices and business community? Even, you know, it, it should not even be a whole of government, but a whole of nation approach. When I think of that end and, and the education and, and and CHED and, and TESDA, we all have this, we put parameters of, oh, okay, this is my, my, my task, but then they need to keep talking with each other and the business community as well, so that you need to make sure that we're, we're doing the right job. <laughs> but how many of our business people can easily call university presidents and vice, and vice versa? For instance, if I have you know, a university president, a UP president, how, can he e easily call Mami Panglinan or, or, or Jasa with just you know, easily, I wonder. I'll tell you, in China again, going back to China, because after all, the current government is trying to promote stronger relations with China. But in, in China, you go to universities, just full professors can call business leaders. But how much of that is happening here? Labor market, okay. the labor market. We have always been pushing for 
for job security, but because of the, the changing nature of the labor market, the gig economy, maybe it's high time to, re to rethink our, our models because it seems that uh, we need to promote more, not just job security, but income security. And that's where we get into your question about universal basic income. We need to start testing. Unfortunately, some of us are fixated that, oh, in, even in case of UBI, to some extent, there is some CCT happening, there's a cash transfer, and then now some other people will say, hindi, akin na lang yan, you know? the slice of the budget from CCT, mas maigi sa akin na lang yan, wag, wag sa CCT, wag sa DSWD. <laughs> so unless we get out of these paradigms and, and, and recognize that we need to expand you know? and, and, and really strengthen our social protection, systems uh, and have a sense of whole of nation paradigm that's the only way that by which we can really move forward and prepare for the future thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr albert and uh, now for our next speaker let's, let's all give a warm welcome to dr rafaelita Aldaba. Assistant Secretary of the Industry Development and Trade Policy Group of the BBI.
ITBPM, well, my friends from ITBPM are here. Um, they are moving up uh, the global value chain from non voice. Uh, they are uh, upgrading their services towards uh, knowledge process outsourcing. For the automotive industry, um, it's still seeking completely knock down uh, uh, assembly and parts manufacturing. We do. Um, Nowadays, because of the CARS program, so uh, we have uh, there have been a lot of investments in terms of the manufacturing of large plastic and metal body parts, along with strategic parts. And uh, for the electronic sector, it's really this sector. It's a high tech sector, but when you look at the different uh, stages of the electronics global value chain, the Philippines is actually doing the work at the lower end. No, at the back end uh, uh, assembly process and test, and primarily uh, this is in the make, in the semiconductor manufacturing services, uh, which are the labor intensive components, no, the assembly, and then for agriculture. Uh, Sorry to say, but uh, we all know about this. We're still in the mechanization phase. So let me just uh, uh, show show you some pictures. I have a I have a, a video, but that would take some time. So uh, I just tried to gather some of the pictures so you can see um, the the current conditions in uh, garments, for example. This is, uh, okay, uh, this is in the garments industry again. We're we're, we're we we are doing a lot of uh, again assembly. Assembly, testing, packaging, that's, that's uh, uh, what we do uh, in, in garments. And uh, a lot of the raw materials, the textiles, and the accessories, these are all important. Um, and then uh, these are uh, pictures from the electronics industry. Uh, th these pictures came from IMI. Um, and IMI is uh, a Filipino multinational. I think the only, uh, the, the, the largest Filipino uh, multinational with uh, branches in many uh, parts of the world. And then this one is, uh, this is uh, Chunichi. Okay. But again, for uh, shipbuilding, we're actually, did you know that we're number four in the world in terms of uh, um, shipbuilding? Top four in Philippines. But um, again, we don't have a steel industry um, and a lot of the inputs that are uh, being used, uh, these are all uh, important. And what, what is the value added of the Philippines? Primarily, it's, uh, it's labor. Okay? And then, um, this is in the auto industry. Well, at least here you can see some some uh, some robots. Um, these are uh, painting robots. They also have uh, hemming hemming robots, but I don't have the the picture here. And then this is assembly, and then this is welding. So this one is um, radiator um, manufacturing. It's the assembly line. It also uh, uh, this picture also uh, comes from uh, one of our parts makers. And then steel manufacturing. Well, we have. These are coming from Steel Asia. We produce these uh, steel bars, but uh, we don't have an integrated steel manufacturing, so we don't have the flats. Then uh, food processing, okay. uh, you can see from the pictures. Uh, this is uh, cacao. This is from the farm of Malagos. Um, and then this is fish processing, shrimp processing, and this is our coffee processing. For auto parts, again, uh, oh, okay, we have ro uh, a robot here, welding. This one is a hemming robot from uh, one of, uh, I think it's Valerie, if I'm not mistaken, uh, parts manufacturer, and uh, also this two coming from uh, auto parts, all these uh, machines. Um, and then next, uh, okay, this, uh, these are also coming from uh, the auto parts processing and assembly as well as uh, this is injection injection molding. This picture, where is that? This one. This is injection molding. Um, IDDPM. Okay, so these are uh, the high uh, high value added jobs uh, design. Okay, and um, so um, this was discussed by. In, uh, based on the findings of the World Economic Forum, uh, the Philippines is considered a legacy country because of our uh, while while our our um, 
uh, production base is uh, already strong, but still uh, we have a low level of readiness for future production, and hence we are at risk. And the reasons that uh, were cited by the study are the following. We have a weak institutional framework. Um, and, uh, I'd like to emphasize that this new industrial uh, strategy is innovation-centered. As you can see, these are, these are the pillars. You have uh, the creation of new industry clusters, human resource development, innovation, and entrepreneurship. These two, uh, they go together. They always go together. Um, MSME and startup development, along with ease of doing business. Um, the three major goals of uh, the IQS, of course, we would like to uh, grow and develop globally competitive and innovative industries with strong forward and backward linkages. We're focusing our efforts on um, innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as improving, making our domestic supply and value chains more efficient, um, so as to uh, increase our chances of uh, deepening our participation in global value chains. And then the last item is our industry cluster approach. Next, um, like what I've said, uh, innovation is in the front and center of our uh, new industrial policy. And this uh, chart that you see here um, shows to us the, the, the underlying framework of this uh, strategy, which is given by the relationship of uh, these three uh, important elements. You have competition, innovation, and entrepreneurship leading to productivity. And uh, the relationships are uh, two-way. The more, the higher the productivity, the higher the competition, leading to more innovation and more entrepreneurship. So, um, uh, Tuz uh, earlier showed us the ranking of the Philippines in terms of uh, the Global Innovation Index. Uh, these are the updated ones uh, for 2018. Nothing has changed, actually. We're still number 73, which uh, we saw in the slide of Tuz. For 2017, we ranked number 73. And no change. We're behind India, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia. I won't mention Singapore anymore, so because Singapore is top five, and below us is uh, Indonesia. But then um, um, Indonesia and uh, um, Cambodia are actually doing a lot of efforts to um, improve their ranking, and so. Um, it, we'll never know. In a, in a few years' time, they might uh, be able to catch up uh, with the Philippines if we don't uh, play our cards right and if we don't put our house in order. So um, uh, again, looking looking at the rankings and comparing the performance of the Philippines, which is given. This is uh, from 2014 up to 2018, and the green line is for the Philippines. So there have been some gradual um, improvements from number 100 in 2014. We're now number 73 for both years, 2017 and 2018. But uh, the sad news is um, our neighbors, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, including Indonesia, which is behind us, all their rankings have improved, but not in the case of the Philippines. So um, what is the problem? The problem is uh, we have a, the, the weak state of our innovation ecosystem. Here we present um, the strengths of uh, our country in terms of graduates in science and engineering, uh, market capitalization, research talent, trade, competition, and scale, we're doing um, quite well. High and medium high-tech manufacturers, so these are our exports of semiconductor uh, and semiconductors and other electronics uh, products, and also ICT services exports, which are um, exports of the IT, BPM sector. We're doing well, but in terms of our weaknesses, it's still very fundamental. Political stability and safety ease of starting a business, expenditure on education, pupil-teacher ratio in the secondary level, number 95, which makes us wonder whether um, the free college tuition is uh, in the right direction. Anyway, ease of getting credit, ease of protecting minority investors. Okay, so 
this is one of the also the, the, the same reasons why we're lagging behind in terms of attracting more foreign direct uh, investment flows. Our production of science and technical articles, also in terms of the quality of our institutions, ICT access, ICT use, innovation linkages, we're not doing well. So um, that uh, um, explain oh, these factors uh, really uh, are the explanations why um, the current state of uh, our innovation is uh, at number seventy-three. Okay, we have uh, another another problem is the low government uh, research budget. There's been some increase, but it's really very far from what the UNESCO requires, which is about 1% of GDP. And so far for 2018, ours is point, uh, this is not a uh, proportion of the GDP, but this is R&D as a proportion of the total government budget, 0.44%. Um, most of it, uh, it, it goes to uh, the DOST as well as to DepEd and the SOOPs, the state universities and colleges through, through CHED. Um, but let me emphasize that um, in the more recent years, there's been a positive momentum and we see that there is um, the presence of university capacity and there's also existing uh, government support in order for us to uh, be able to uh, invest more in research and innovation. So uh, the, the momentum is there, but we hope that this is uh, going to continue in the coming uh, years. Um, another problem is the limited coordination. Of course, Toots pointed this out earlier, limited coordination among the research granting agencies. Who are these research granting agencies? These are the OSD, DA for agriculture and shed, of course, for higher education. And all of these agencies, they have really very nice, uh, very nice programs. But uh, uh, when you ask them whether they uh, work together or whether they are able to coordinate their research agenda um, or whether they are in touch with the private sector, because um, you conduct all this research. But if these are not commercialized, if these are not turned into products, uh, we fail. <laughs> I mean, all, this, all these investments that uh, we are making uh, would not be able to produce um, the, the, the innovation that we want to happen, which is actually the intention why we are uh, putting, a, uh, putting some budget into this uh, institution. So this is the reason why we have all these broken lines, because uh, the linkages are still uh, relatively weak. Although for DOSD and DTI, we, we partnered uh, last year, we signed uh, an MOU and we agreed to uh, formulate the innovation and entrepreneurship roadmap. Um, why are we here? Uh, we're not a research granting agency, but DTI, uh, uh, DTI is uh, uh, among these uh, innovation uh, agencies because we also invest uh, a lot in terms of putting up <coughs> publication laboratories, shared uh, services facilities, negotiation centers. The intellectual property office is also an attached agency of uh, the DTI along with uh, the board of investments which is providing R&D incentives as well as um, other incentives for uh, for industries, okay. And okay, what about uh, the linkages between uh, the academe and industry? I have here uh, five studies, three from USA. Um, very, th these are very recent studies, uh, 2014 to 2017, as well as uh, 2011 from PIDS and 2017 from PIDS, which was uh, also discussed by Toots earlier. Um, and in all of these studies, uh, they found that uh, there's really weak linkage between industry and academe, and uh, instead of collaboration, there's actually competition between the industry and academe. There's widespread mistrust between the two um, institutions. There's also a lack of a strong culture of research um, in the universities, no critical mass in terms of uh, volume of research. But one, one important thing that was pointed out is uh, the difficulty in terms of the procurement laws that our university researchers must go through. Um, 
uh, there are times when uh, when uh, projects are, are already uh, completed, but the budget has not yet been released. So um, a, really, a lot of things that we need to we need to change. And uh, the solution is uh, really there is a need for us to bridge the gaps in our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, which as we said, there are a lot of missing linkages, a lot of missing players, and um, essentially lack of connectedness. Those are the players in the innovation ecosystem, and these are the players in our entrepreneurship ecosystem, and we need, we need to link the two to together. Uh, we need to ensure that the um, innovate that the uh, R and D products or the innovation outputs being uh, produced by uh, the academe uh, will be uh, commercialized, will be translated into uh, products which uh, consumers would buy. Okay, so. Um, like what I have said earlier, the DOST and DDI signed an MOU last year. So our proposal now is, uh, well, it's no longer a proposal because partly the MOU has already been expanded. In fact, it's, it was signed last year. Uh, no, not la last week, sorry. Um, last week we launched uh, the Inclusive Philippine Innovation and uh, Entrepreneurship Roadmap. And during the launching, we uh, signed uh, an MOU, uh, so we expanded DPI, DOST, um, NEDA, DA, DevEd, CHED, along with uh, the ICT. So we are now uh, there are now seven seven signatories to uh, to, oh, to 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 the MOU, and the the agencies uh, that I've mentioned they agreed to collaborate in, in, in implementing the uh, goals of the, and the, the uh, policies and strategies and programs under the roadmap. Um, the main recommendation of the roadmap is uh, the creation of regional inclusive innovation centers. Um, we look at this, uh, or RIICs, RICs, we, we look at these RICs are as at the cornerstone of IQS and they would reach the gap between um, industry and academe. And I'd like to point out that um, the creation of these rigs, which uh, uh, by the way is also tantamount to building the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem in the regions, it's not really about um, putting up the physical infrastructure, but it's more of the coordination, it's more of the interaction among the different uh, the different players. Um, so uh, we 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 want uh, the universities to link up with uh, the science and technology parks that are being built, the incubators, fab labs, co-working spaces, the uh, uh, SME startups, and uh, large enterprises. Along with, of course, we need the support of the LGUs. Now let's turn to um, our. I mentioned here that the innovation focus uh, is uh, on these industries, electronics, auto, aerospace, chemicals, IT, BPM, and agribusiness. So I would also want to describe the more specific activities that we would like to uh, develop. These are the upgrading trajectories that we have identified for uh, these five industries. Um, actually, we we uh, we need to link all these industries together because right now um, there are a lot of missing linkages. There are a lot of gaps in our supply and value chain, and that's also the reason why our importations of raw materials, parts and components, intermediate goods are really really huge, and they contribute also a lot to the trade deficit that the country has been uh, having for de many decades now. And, and so the only way really for us is, <laughs> what happened? The, the only way really for us re is to uh, establish um, and attract more investments into these uh, sectors because uh, uh, in order for us to survive the strong competition arising from Industry 4.0 and other developments like regional regional integration, um, it's really important to make our industries more competitive. And to make them more competitive, 
we need to be innovative. And, and so uh, th that's the direction of our uh, new industrial policy. Well, I won't uh, go each one, but um, maybe I'll just mention, like for, for instance, for uh, electronics, we want to go more into R&D, more into IC design or products using um, Internet of Things, robotics, etc. Um, we, we also want to go into aerospace electronics, consumer electronics, and auto electronics. And a lot of this, you can see that um, there are many common uh, areas identified in each. And you would see, for example, in automotive, there's also uh, auto electronics, aerospace, there's aerospace electronics. So um, ITBPM is uh, engineering things uh, or high value added uh, activities like engineering services outsourcing. Um, and ESO is uh, also appearing in automotive uh, as well as in construction. Data analytics, legal process outsourcing, health information uh, management, and so on. Agribusiness, uh, we want to go uh, into um, high value crops like mangoes, bananas, nuts, coffee, cacao, coconut and other resource-based industries. So um, we've done the same for the other industries. You have construction, transport, logistics, furniture, garments, creative, shipbuilding, iron and steel, uh, parts and components, and chemicals. But um, our, our industry upgrading strategy in the short to medium run is really um, closing the supply and value chain gaps. So while I'm saying that, uh, okay, we go into uh, the manufacture of products using uh, Industry 4.0 technologies, but at the same time, uh, there are still a lot of gaps in uh, when you look at the supply and value chain of the automotive industry. There uh, are still uh, uh, opportunities in metal casting, in forging, in machining. These are more uh, labor intensive uh, sectors, but at the same time, we need also to um, take advantage of the opportunities from Industry 4.0. So we're going into uh, auto electronics, which is uh, in preparation for EV uh, in the future or for driverless cars. So a lot of these parts would be um, electronics. So we need um, uh, auto electronics. We, we need to at least, no? At least we, we, we need the capacity, we need the capabilities to be present here in the country. More into ESO, R&D, uh, sensors, and advanced driver assistance system. Um, so last item, um, we're trying to attract more uh, labor intensive industries, side by side with uh, high tech uh, activities. What we want to do is to be able to um, produce uh, goods or uh, be able to bring in the activities in the country with a good balance of semi-automation and labor-intensive work. For instance, assembly, meat inspection would still require labor-intensive work. So, it, 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 in, I mean automation and robotics, they want 18.9 in industry and 22% in agriculture, fishing, and forestry. Um, when you look at uh, our um, unemployed, there are 2.34 million Filipinos uh, currently uh, unemployed. And looking now at their characteristics, many of them actually have a high school and college uh, level. They've reached uh, both high school and college. 36% uh, have reached uh, college. 43% have reached uh, high school. And um, looking at uh, our, our, our uh, students, Okay, um, STEM graduates uh, actually declined from 235,000 in 2015 to 214,000 in 2017. So in 2017, they comprise only 30% of the total number of graduates. And many of our students are actually going to business administration and um, education courses. So there is an increase in uh, that their number from 296,000 in 2014 to 341,000 in 2017. So they practically comprised half of our graduates. But um, 
given given the demand, uh, given the, the future uh, activities that uh, we are preparing our industries, uh, th there seems th there seems to be a, a mismatch, right? Um, so uh, we need to we need to correct this. We need to address. Uh, well, right now there's already uh, a problem with respect to our uh, skills and jobs mismatch, and we don't want this to deteriorate any further. But if this is the trend uh, that we're seeing right now, um, it's a little bit, to me, it's a little bit alarming, and we should really do something about it. So, um, okay, so this, I, I've now come to the last two slides, and just to, just to conclude, um, we have an industrial <coughs> Uh, policy that is innovation focused. We're trying to link manufacturing with agriculture as well as with uh, services. We've also emphasized that um, productivity is important because um, through pro increases in productivity, we will be able to um, uh, sustain uh, an inclusive, uh, inclusive growth. And in order for us to do that, innovation would be crucial. It's innovation that's going to lead to uh, higher competitiveness and higher productivity. Um, our innovation and entrepreneurship strategy aims at creating more uh, connected and creative communities through these regional inclusive innovation centers that uh, we are proposing to build. Um, actually, there are assessment to, to see, to further deepen the analysis in terms of the um, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem um, in these uh, four uh, regions that I've mentioned. Um, so the focus also is uh, strengthening our government, academic, and industry uh, collaboration, particularly in pursuing more basic and applied uh, research as well as market-oriented research that would solve uh, societal problems and address um, industry issues. Uh, last point is on uh, the regional inclusive innovation centers which we um, envision uh, as uh, the key to bridging the gap between innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, six more points, that, or do I have to stop here? Is it okay? Okay. Um, very important, and I, I think uh, both Toots and Jikyongbe also emphasize the need for us to focus on uh, human capital development. This is crucial because um, um, knowledge, because we, it's the human capital development that is necessary for us to uh, pursue more knowledge production, technology adoption, leading to more productivity um, growth. Sorry. And then um, we also need to um, ensure that our educational system, so more reforms would be needed in this aspect. We need to uh, ensure that our educational system would be able to produce the quality of human capital that can um, advance innovation and entrepreneurship. And we're not just referring to the higher education here, but uh, from basic sec and, and, and secondary all of these things, basic, secondary, and tertiary, uh, we should be able to uh, improve uh, in terms of uh, the values, the skills, and the competencies that are needed, uh, especially in preparing our workforce for the future. Um, we cannot uh, emphasize this enough, the need for a strong government, industry, uh, academe, or education collaboration. We need policies and training programs that are uh, more responsive to the fast changing uh, dynamics of industry and we, like what I've said uh, we th there's um, there's a need for our industry and um, government uh, and uh, academe to talk um, so as to address this uh, technology and skills uh, mismatch <coughs> fourth point um, it's our low skill low educated and routinized jobs that are the most vulnerable to the adverse effect of uh, Industry 4.0. And, and so it's really very important for us to uh, provide the safety nets through innovation and R&D with education and training. And this is 
actually uh, what the iCube is, is all about, what um, the inclusive Philippine innovation and entrepreneurship uh, roadmap uh, wants to pursue. It is, it is this uh, uh, fifth point that I am emphasizing here. Um, and finally, this is an appeal <laughs> to, my, to, to, to all of you, my friends, uh, from from uh, um, from ha the House of Representatives, um, you need to help us also um, in terms of uh, funding. How how do how can we fund the implementation of all this uh, of all these industry development programs, of all these uh, innovation um, uh, activities that we want to pers pursue in the future? of all these bricks that uh, we want to establish. USAID is not going to be here with us forever. Um, even other development partners uh, won't support us forever. They would be here during the startup uh, uh, period, but um, for us to be able to sustain this, we need a program, we need our own program. and. Um, I mean, it, it, it's so easy to prepare all this. Well, relatively speaking, it's easier to uh, prepare. It's e very easy to plan. Uh, but in terms of implementing those plans, when people start asking me, so how much budget do you have? I'm really, really embarrassed because I don't ha I have zero budget. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing this, but um, Thankfully, our, our secretary uh, supports uh, the innovation, this innovation ep efforts, industry development linked with uh, innovation. And so we're, we're still able to get some funds. But if you compare the budget that uh, we have as compared to the budget that other countries have to prepare for Industry 4.0, my god, I don't, I don't know. But uh, the gap is really, really huge. And so maybe maybe you could help us by uh, by um, maybe passing a legislation because to me after four years in DTI that's um, one lesson is it's difficult if we just rely on the GAA very difficult you'll never know they would just in the in my first two years MRP the manufacturing resurgence program um, we, we were given a budget but after two years no more and now the the mrp mrp work has already evolved we now we now were able to discover that oh we should focus on innovation and um we don't have and sad to say there is no there is no budget i've discussed with you what the problems are but um and we have very good recommendations but um, to properly, effectively implement this, for us to be able to improve those numbers that you have seen, we really need to put, to put some, some funds into these activities. We need to put our money where our mouth is. So um, please help us secure a budget or uh, come up with a le legislation that would enable the Philippines to prepare for Industry 4.0. It is going to hit um, so many problems. Our lack of competitiveness, the industry development that we've been longing for, the industrialization that we've been wanting to happen, innovation. So um, please. And then the, the second one, that's the most important. Second one um, is in terms of relaxing the regulations in terms of procurement, government procurement. There's so much that we can do if only we could relax uh, our procurement rules. Um, restrictions on the employment of foreigners uh, along with other innovation related services. So, um, last na po, last na talaga. Innovation lies at the heart of our new industrial strategy. It lies at the core of any solution to the challenges we are now facing. And whether we are in government, whether we are in academe or in industry, in civil society, as leaders, it is our business imperative to continuously reinvent, rethink, and reimagine. Let us all work together and collaborate to advance innovation um, 
address those gaps between the innovation ecosystem and the entrepreneurship ecosystem, uplift the lives of the Filipino people, and make the Philippines a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Andaba. Now we go to the next part of our program, which is the reaction from our industry representatives, and I have the pleasure to introduce them to you one by one. Uh, first, he is the President and CEO of the IT and Business Process Association of the Philippines, or IBPAC. He plays a crucial role of being the voice of the IT PPM industry, and is an advocate for the industry both locally and globally by raising awareness of the Philippines' unique value proposition attracting both investors and locators to the country. On a local level, he works passionately in partnering with stakeholders of the IT BPM industry to continue the growth trajectory outlined in IBPAP's program Roadmap 2022. The primary goal of this roadmap is to enable growth throughout the country and effectively create millions of jobs for the Filipino people. Our industry representative from IBPAP has spent the last 19 years in Accenture, where he started as an experienced manager providing consultancy services to a number of local and international clients. Until his retirement in 2016, he served as the industry group lead for the communications, media, and entertainment and high-tech portfolio in Accenture's Philippine Delivery Center. <coughs> Our representative worked for Nestle, Cargill, and ICTI, ICTSI early in his career. He graduated from the Ateneo de Manila University with a double degree in physics and computer engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Ray Escarilla Untal from the IT Business and Process Association of the Philippines. Next, uh, from the Electronic Industries Association of the Philippines, he has been in the ICT industry involved in servicing electronics, property, telecom, banking, and finance industries. He provides advisory services in ICT management particularly in the areas of strategy mapping, review of key projects, and manpower training and development. He has been a consultant to government agencies, which include PCSO, ASTI, DOST, Supreme Court, among others, as well as with the World Bank and the ADB. Our electronics industry representative obtained his master's in business administration at the Wharton Graduate School and Master of Science, Computer, and Information Sciences at the Moore School of Engineering. He also received a joint degree program at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, completed his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering at the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all uh, welcome Director Victor Gouret of the Electronics <laughs> Industry Association of the Philippines. And last but not the least, he is the Disaster Risk Reduction and Climate Change Specialist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations of the Philippines, Nations in the Philippines. Previously, he held consultancy positions in the ADB and in, and in Water Leaks for a USAID-funded initiative as a climate change specialist. He was also a research associate at Asian Institute of Technology where he helped in implementing a three-year regional research project funded by the International Climate Change Climate Initiative under the German Federal Ministry of Environment, Nature Conser Conservation, Building, and Nuclear Safety. Our representative from uh, the FAO has over 10 years of professional experience in managing projects conducting academic and field research on various environmental management, disaster risk reduction and management, and climate change adaptation projects across Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Claudius Cesar Dio, Gabinete of the Food and Agriculture Committee.
And first to give his uh, uh, reaction uh, today is uh, may I invite Mr. Ray Scarilla on time. still awake. <laughs> I know we were supposed to have this uh, reaction like an hour ago, but the topic has been truly interesting. And I, I, I like the fact that I continue to learn when I attend sessions like this. No? And it's a shame that uh, Dr. Kang has left. Um, interestingly, uh, Asik, Pita, and I had been in so many sessions together, no? so my KPI for the success of our industry is if I don't meet with her as frequent as I am meeting with her now. <laughs> Again, I just would like to spend some time to talk about um, what this means for the IT and BPM industry or more commonly known as the BPO industry. No? Um, I couldn't agree more with many of the things that has been said earlier. And I, while I will debate you know, on the point around how profound the impact will be of AI and IA, or Intelligent Automation, on our industry as well as with other industries, I will not debate the fact that it will have its impact. And before I get into that point, one of the things that I just want, would like to lay down as context for everyone here, and a lot of the things that has been discussed has been around education and the need to upskill and reskill and cross-skill our talent. Not a lot of people know this, but if you look at our current graduates, no? And by the way, we produce in excess of clo pretty close to 700,000 students no? every year, college students. And that's by far not a small feat. No? It is in fact one advantage that we have that we are truly capitalizing on. But one of the recent studies that we have done is that when we talk about employability, no? then that is where it becomes a problem. Uh, one study uh, which was recently released specifically on the employability of Filipino graduates points to the fact that generously speaking, and the key word here is generously, no? hireability amongst the Filipino graduates in the areas, where, in the disciplines that they are supposedly a graduate of is pegged at 30%. So that's the employability or hireability angle that we have. Now, specific to the industry that I represent, when we zoom in on a number of disciplines that are needed by our industry, the news gets worse. Because employability becomes, or hireability becomes anywhere between 8% to 15%. So if you look at the numbers, while we do have a lot of graduates, the employability figures are not appealing. And that is why, you know, if I put on my hat as a practitioner before, before I assume this role, that explains why we typically have to go through anywhere between 10 to 12 CVs before we hire one individual. And it validates the hireability numbers. Now, there has been a number of alignment no, between government, <coughs> academia, and industry. And in fact, we have PIBED, no, Philippine Business for Education, which is another advocacy group that truly tries to push the needle in terms of how we can have a stronger linkage between government and academe and the industry. I, in particular, am a part of the National Industry and Academic Council, where we look at 
you know, if we are assessing the needs of the industry now, what are the interventions that we need to be doing so that we can better influence hireability down the road? And the challenge that I quoted earlier in terms of hireability is the point where we are talking about preparing individuals for the jobs now. We are not even talking about preparing individuals for the jobs of the future. And this is where it becomes more of a challenge because the future is not 20 years away. The future is anywhere between three years to five years. And in fact, right now, we try to, we're, we're looking for a crystal ball that will allow us to predict exactly what the jobs will be five years, 10 years down the road. And it's very difficult. We're in fact trying to use the supercomputer that Dr. Kang has in AIM, seriously, to look into analytics, no? to have a prescriptive model that will determine exactly what the jobs will be. But the, the point is, it's very difficult to triangulate that with available information now. And so what do we get? We get skills. We're looking at what skills we need to be developing. So the, I think the, so having, having said a lot of this though, no, it just underpins the need really to have perhaps a very specific industry, an industry specific skill up program. You know? Much more if we could actually venture into a Philippine wide uh, lifelong upskilling program. And this is where I will zoom in on our recommendation, and this, some of these we've already had conversations with uh, DDI and BOI. We've also had conversations around this with um, DOF. We've also had conversations about this with um, the good speaker. No? Um, and, and it speaks about what can we do to really influence and push the needle in terms of upskilling and cross-skilling that will have a material benefit, at least for now, for an industry that I am a part of, but make it agnostic enough that we can also apply the same principles to other industries. And what we eventually came up with, and again, this is not something that we you know, invented. Um, in arriving at this program, we have looked at regional inspirations or regional benchmarks. No? I think earlier, um, uh, Dr. Albert mentioned the Skills Future Program of Singapore. That's one fantastic program. It's a lifelong learning program where Singapore has determined that these are the skills that they need for the future. And every national Every citizen who takes training that helps in achieving that will get it for free. If you look at Malaysia, they're also doing something similar in the context of Talent Corp. That's how they label that. If you look at India, they also have a program called the National Skills Development Council. It has been in place for more than 10 years and has been effective in skilling up 12 million nationals. So here in the Philippines, what we have crafted is a program that will touch the lives of a million Filipinos. Why a million? Well, there's, there's something there for the industry because we employ 1.2 million. And we believe that over the next few years, we need to likewise redefine the skill sets of these individuals. And we said, what does it take for us to create a program that will skill up a million Filipinos? And how long will it, will it take us? And we came up with a simple figure, 40 billion pesos for the next five years to skill up you know, this, um, uh, this many Filipinos. We have a, 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 a label for it. No? Philippine Talent Upskilling Corporation. Now we use Philippine 
so that it can become applicable later on for a national nationwide program. But I will, uh, I would like to call it patok, no? patok, Philippine talent upskilling. Um, but there are many other things that we need to be doing, like seeking initial funding. The current trabajo bill has some provisions for that fund that we are looking at partially. But there is something here that we need to really be looking into, more than just the petty discussions that we have now, because this upskilling, cross-skilling in the light of the digital revolution is going to be existential, not just for our industry, but for the Philippines as well. So I'll pause here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, now may we call on uh, Mr. Victor Gruet of the Electronic Industries Association of the Philippines. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Um, looking at everything that has been said, of course, uh, we being in the electronics industry, that's how it's going to be in the next couple of years. No? Um, my background is electrical engineering, computer science, so yan yung nakikita natin as an engineer. That's how it would uh, look like. But it does not mean that everyone would have to be a data scientist. It does not mean that everyone would have to be a computer engineer. Uh, like in the other countries right now, Singapore, Germany, US, I think uh, let's make it easy now. You can have four categories of jobs: very high tech, high tech, medium, uh, low tech, no tech. <laughs> okay, <ba yan? laughs> So even in Germany, it's more or less divided into I think 30 percent, 20 percent, more or less. The, one. the high tech does not cover everything. So more or less evenly divided. Uh, interestingly enough, if you compare the German profile and the US profile, you will see that Germany has a bigger high-tech component compared to the US. So the high-tech component shows when you look at Mercedes-Benz, Audi. So high precision, high-tech <coughs> So that brings me also to the Philippine side. You know, so we don't have to be afraid of 4.0. It just means that we have to prepare for it. Not everyone will have to have a very high tech job, but obviously somehow they will be affected by it. You know, either in the tools that they use, that uh, the bank or the ATM that they go to is to withdraw their money or pay something or buy something from the internet um, that's how it is. Uh, we cannot avoid from horse and buggy days to cars. No, 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 and government, especially. Otherwise, we will not be able to adjust to the things that the industry 4.0 would require. For example, so my background is electronics. So we know what happened to Malaysia, Korea, Taiwan the past 40 years. So Philippines, uh, when I was still younger, <laughs> Ang tawag ko doon ay laissez-faire lahat dyan, although I'm not an economist. Laissez-faire lahat dyan. In other words, wala tayong budget para doon. Hindi <laughs> 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 as an engineer, that's how I look it. Pero mukhang totoo naman yun, di ba? <laughs> so even the World Bank guys said, uh, just last May when they were here, uh, I think uh, laissez-faire, this is where laissez-faire was, ano yun? Got, got to its uh, lowest level or whatever. <laughs> so we never knew what it was, how to work together. We never knew how to work with linkages without, without, uh, 
without uh, angering the World Trade Organization. While all the other countries around us somehow were able to go around World Trade Organization rules without circumventing that. So right now, if you're looking at why aren't we creating more companies, aside from difficulty in registering new companies, uh, I happen to live in the worst yeah. most difficult place to start a business, <laughs> which is San Juan. <laughs> so, you know, things that we have to work on. Uh, we have not created a market where the government actually could have created a market. Whereas in other countries, especially uh, Korea, for example, if we're marveling how Korea went up from zero to wherever where it is right now, they created markets, and those markets are the things that the seven chai balls uh, went into, including Samsung. So somehow, and the new government, because they did not, have, they didn't look at the sector at all. So it was all a supported economy, if you will. So we have to look into that, uh, and that tells me that we have to look, work on COA, number one. <laughs> And 9184. So somehow, kahit yung mga entrepreneurs that we're talking to, uh, kung sa USD, they never can get together. Paano? They will never get away from 9184, and they will never be able to come up with products that will meet the requirements of DOH, for example. Kahit na makakasilala na sila, they will never be. Because 1984 is very in the, in the middle to stop the in effect will not happen. So those are the things that we have to look at to help the industry grow to where you want to be. Kung nakita natin kanina ay more more or less equally divided yung high, medium, medium low, and low. Uh, it's up to us how we want to look at it. Okay. Now beyond what we saw there, interestingly. So everything made on AI, di ba? Uh, data science, analytics, everything. Uh, if we don't do anything, we will be uh, bloody. We will be powered by all of those technologies. In effect, matatapunan tayo, number one. But, but that is if we don't do anything. The nice thing about it is we are also in that same market. We can be, and actually we are. We're talking to one of them. We're talking to one of the companies making the AI chip. So if we use our cards right, we can be part of that whole industry 4.0. So we will not all be parang bludgeoned. <laughs> no. So we can, if we, are more active, then we can be uh, one of the lead players in, in AI and data science. But obviously, we have to move up our skill levels to, to where those companies can now approach us for our skills. So that's where we have to do our own reskilling, et cetera, et cetera. Not, not too difficult, but obviously we have to do it. As part of industry, electronics. So the other part of it is, uh, for example, right now if we're talking about electronics, as uh, as Peter has mentioned, we are high tech na sa ating yung electronics ngayon. But actually, that's at the bottom of the electronics uh, pyramid, if you will. The assembly desk is the lowest, parang the lowest value uh, the lowest in terms of yung profitability in the whole supply chain. So, so we have to look for ways to move up the value chain. So the Electronics Industries Association is uh, advocacy is how do we go up the value chain? So we're, uh, we've asked uh, the UST and DTI and they've uh, helped us by setting up the Electronics Product Development Center in Dakota. It's UST funded actually. So that's helping the small and large companies companies in general, including students, to come out with new products. So that's the part of the innovation thing. 
where normally they could not justify it or they could not afford it to begin with. So that place will allow engineers to come out with new products, uh, re-engineer old products. So anything that would come out, allow them to come out with new products at the low level of engineering the moon and low volume. Prototype the moon, one or two pieces, five pieces, ten pieces. And so now we're attracting the interest of companies, large and small students, to go into that space. I think that's the place you know, that we have to look at because uh, with the help of TESS and DOI, of course, our industry has moved up. Um, but the linkages among companies have not flourished. Um, I, I don't know exactly, but uh, right now, if we, we were asking for ways to propagate the industry, for example, this electronics. So, see, may pwede namin ang kasan. Mayroon kami brochure. Kami mo ba namin pwede bigay yan para ma-disseminate sa industry members? Aside from our friends in safety, wala nang iba. Wala na kayo bang pwede parang vehicle. Ito yung brochure namin, kami mo ba namin pwede pwede bigay yan? Wala. So, so yun na yun yung vacuum. It's not undoable, it's doable, but we have to work on something. And that vacant or the vacuum is basically what will link all the different companies, uh, academia and government included, to be able to do all of these things we said na kailangan natin link. So it's not undoable, it just has to be done. Hopefully PESA can have more you know, role in that area. Uh, we're helping, we hope that moves further. That other part na pala is when you look at Industry 4.0, the innovation cycle there has to be much shorter. The BOI that we have and the PESA that we have was built on an innovation cycle which takes years. Now because it started 40 years ago, in eh? araw, okay lang yun, 40 years ago. <laughs> but now you want uh, an innovation cycle that's mentioned in the days or weeks or maybe months at the most. So, yung, Yung design natin of uh, PESA and BUI in terms of incentives, in terms of an will have to be <coughs> reshaped. <laughs> uh, be reshaped. So basically, for example, 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, we had a study with DOST which says since Mashadon top secret, we could not get anything out of industry in terms of what they want, what, where they want to go. So in the end, the researcher came out with R&D place na lang ang Philippines. USC funded stuff. So, so yun na nga nangyari. Since by default, walang masabi kung ano yung skills na kailangan nyo, R&D na lang nilagay niya. That was about more than 10 years ago. So theoretically, ganun na nga nangyari. <laughs> Since masyadong top secret, hanggang ganun na lang pwede natin sa DN. But now that we are more open, and we will be given this chance to promote it now. Now, those companies are now opening up so hopefully, na mawala na yung mga NDA. In effect, lahat yun naka-NDA. So wala tuloy makausap sila. Kanya-kanyang silo. It's bad enough that you have a silo in ito industry lang, ito government lang. Ito, bawat kumpanya pa, silo. So wala silang kausap. Top secret lahat nga eh. So everything now has to be imported. So if everything's imported, just about nothing is locally available. So hopefully, yun yung change natin. You have more of it done locally, you'll have more R&D, you have to have more jobs. You have, we also have to open up the job market, uh, more foreign investments, because that's the only way we'll have new technologies to work on. You know, we have to complete the supply chain. When we say that there's this opportunity available, then there are more engineers and technologies who will come into our area. Thank you very much, the Director Pruitt. And uh, last but not the least, uh, may we call on Mr. Claudio Cesar Deo Gabinete of uh, the Food and Agri Agriculture Organization. Hello, magandang hapon po. Uh, maraming salamat sa House of Representatives as well as uh, PADS for inviting FAO to this uh, event. It's quite a, not 
it's quite seldom that the FAO and UN agencies like us, especially technical organizations like us, gets invited to, to you know, uh, gathering like this where we can not only share uh, what we're doing with FAO, but also provide some some recommendations and hopefully helpful recommendations to uh, to our people who are doing that, you know, people in the legislation. So. Just to give you a brief uh, overview on what maybe we're doing in FAO that's related to this fourth industrial resolution. So we have been fortunate to work together with the Department of Agriculture in terms of mainstreaming what we call e agriculture strategies to their main commodity programs. And right now, what we're doing with DA, we're working with DA is mainstreaming the use of remote sensing and geospatial technologies for their planning purposes uh, in two ways. One is it's quite important for them to plan further out, not just in terms of you know uh, monthly, seasonal, but also annually, in terms of their crop management. So we're using that. And the other one is getting more critical more and more is for disaster risk reduction management, as well as for climate change adaptation. And this is where I come in. Uh, when you talk about the DRR and the CCA specialist, you know, like that. Because this is one of the, our main entry points in convincing DA to invest more and more in these types of technology. So there's a potential need. So, sabi nga nila, mother is, uh, what, sorry, uh, uh, when there's a need for it, it becomes, uh, it, it can catalyze some sort of mainstreaming or some sort of propagation of particular technology. But as we all know, this does not always happen. I mean, eight years ago when I was just lying down on my bed, fiddling, when I was still doing my masters, I read this manifesto by Satoshi, which all of you now has practically, I mean, one Bitcoin is 7,000, 6,000 USD. And during that time, it's just a dollar. So if well, I could have just taken this guy seriously, <laughs> I would have not be standing here anymore. I would be, you know, in a yacht somewhere in the Pacific, enjoying my Bitcoin money. But no one else, no one here can predict technology, how it will shape um, in the future. Everything that, even if we run maybe in, uh, using analytics, everything there will be just future technology bubble. And if you, you look at the, the sci-fi novels in the 1970s, 1960s. Uh, what we have here now is completely different. Some in good ways, I mean, no one could have predicted a technology like this one. I mean, everything that we see in the Asimov no novels, all box type, clunky, very heavy uh, technologies, but now this is part of us. Actually, uh, in one of the discussions that I've been listening over on YouTube, uh, we are now cyborg because this has become part and parcel of our body. We cannot longer function without it. I cannot, I cannot function without myself properly for job. But uh, one of the key things that we have to always keep in mind is how do we manage this disruptive innovations? Like what I was saying earlier, how could, have, how could we at least make sure that uh, we take part in this kind of innovation? I mean, the development organization, development organizations like us, although we FAO pride ourselves as technical agencies, technical agency, we still lag behind sometimes. And, you know, have picking key technologies, key innovations, making it work for, let's say, agriculture, for sustainable development. And then admittedly, Tao and Dai. So we, don't, we cannot really foresee so far ahead. But once we, once these innovations become known to us, we have to be able to get into our feet and act quickly and make sure make use of this technology. For example, blockchain technology, which is behind the Bitcoin, um, it's it took us what seven years for UN agencies, even the World Bank, to make use of blockchain technology for their ledgers. And it's and even until this point, we're only doing it at a very pilot stage. We haven't the, the World Bank hasn't really been fully convinced to mainstream it all over your system. So it's just part of it, even a small unit within the world that's using the top technology for the ledgers. 
Well, uh, some humanitarian agencies are also using it for um, cash vouchers, cash voucher systems, or to distribute and also to monitor and make sure that no no hanky panky are you know, happening at the local level when these cash vouchers are being given away to to those who are provided with humanitarian assistance, for example. We, so well, the point is that it's quite there's a gestation period for catching up. And I think it is our duty as uh, development partners, and also even those at the, the uh, private organization businesses have to um, keep up on. The other one, uh, the other one, the, the other things that well, maybe I would like to share is um, the, the, some tricky things, more practical, something that we can do something about in terms of legislation, in terms of you know some key policy changes within within our institutions within government institutions that in the course of you know mainstreaming this remote sensing geospatial technologies that we're trying to offer to da something that we some of the stumbling blocks that we, we encountered one being is the interoperability uh, interoperability meaning that once we install the system an ict system information system let's say for mapping technologies or uh, assessment, uh, assessment methodologies. Sometimes um, another agency, let's say Pagas or EOSD, would have a different system. And uh, we will have a hard time in terms of comparing data, making sure that you know, our assessments are actually telling the same story. So there needs to be more effort in terms of harmonizing uh, not just the technology, but also the information systems. That uh, that are being used in uh, to different innovations being promoted in different agencies. The second one is enabling framework. So once we have done this, we once we have piloted this technologies, these innovations, where does it go? Most of the projects that for that we as development organizations do often end up at the pilot stage. Pilot dito, pilot don, and this community A, community B. But it never really gets mainstream, and there are several reasons um, uh, behind this. And uh, one, of course, political interest. Uh, second, is the technology behind that pilot is too nascent, so it doesn't get a lot of traction. Wala uh, tiwala sa teknolohiya. In many cases, not uh, it's not just the government, but also the beneficiaries themselves. So you try to pilot um, a very <coughs> high-tech uh, solution for, uh, how do you say, for advisory service, for extension, uh, using, let's say, uh, uh, mobile tablet to de deliver extension services among farmers. But they don't accept it. They don't readily accept it. Kasi yung nakikita nila tao dun sa, ano, sa, na nag-demonstrate sa kanila ng advisory, hindi nila kilala. So it's not readily accepted. So then, of course, um, the, the, the final issue is that nakita na natin, uh, it has been piloted successfully. Uh, it has been, uh, uh, what do you call this, accepted by the community, accepted by the beneficiaries, accepted by the stakeholders. Mahirap mag justify ilagay sa budget. Because these are, uh, again, uh, these are activities that sometimes when you put ICT and PA, mahirap siyang pagtagpian kagad. And he will change justify. So a bit of more open-mindedness in terms of um, accepting or mainstreaming these kinds of activities that make use of, you know, that goes beyond the mechanization, but actually going to young Web 3.0 or industrialization, industrial revolution 4.0. So that's it from uh, FAO. And uh, thank you again. Again, we uh, come to our open forum. Uh, uh, for those who want to ask their questions, again, uh, please uh, identify yourself first and your organization. Ah, sir.